OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Half past seven, OTB AM. You're welcome along to the show. Oh, what fun. Shane, good morning to you. Good morning, how are things? Happy Friday. Colin, good morning to you. Adrian, Shane, good morning. What's happening? Oh, this is, do you know, lots going on. Thank God for the Champions League. We have a suite of stuff to talk about at the top yeah. of the show, and we have a busy show coming up after that, of course, as well. But uh, the stuff we have to talk about, and you can jump in here wherever you want. Shane Long had some interesting, really interesting, and forthright things to say about the his, let's call it, treatment under Stephen Kenny. Uh, Tottenham are the latest club linked with Evan Ferguson. Uh, we had Chelsea Leon last night in the Champions League. Really interesting game that Chelsea somehow, despite being a goal behind with almost the last kick of the game, managed to force a penalty shootout and come through on the right side and go in to meet Barcelona now in the semi finals. And Padraig Harrington, uh, lowest round of the PGA Tour for the last mm, two or three years, a 68 at the Texas Open and tied for the lead after the first day. So, whatever you're having yourself there, where do you want to jump in? Uh, I think we've got to go with Chelsea, don't we? Yeah. Come into that game, very, very late finish. Looked like Leon the holders were going through, 2 0 up in the night, and then a penalty. Was it soft? We started our pre show meeting this morning. Little, just to, just describe it behind then, the scenes. It, just it. behind the scenes. Was it soft? Lauren James had the ball in the penalty area. She was veering left out towards the corner flag, had two Leon players around her. Was, I would say, I would say clipped and then almost fell over herself and fell over. When you look at it live from the wide shot, it looked like, no, that's a, almost a dive. Mm. And then you watched Oof. it in and you were like, oh no, it's a penalty. It took it's 100% a, the penalty. It took isn't me it? about 10 watches to, to realise that she had been clipped though. Because it, it looks like she kicks her own leg, but, it, it, but she, she, she looks to be clipped see, and then she kicks her own leg. I think once you see the slow-mo replay, there's no debate about it. it in Absolutely. real time, watching it real time, I thought, oh no. Because actually, in that split second before she turned that way, she was been like this. This, by the way, was the last second of uh, extra time. Yeah. So this was like absolute desperation stakes Take for the Chelsea. They were yeah. uh, two nil down on the night against Leon, two one in aggregate, needing the goal to force a penalty shootout. Mm. And uh, when James gets the ball, she's sort of shepherded towards the, the end line. And I thought, oh well, she's absolutely bottleless, and there's you know they're not going to create a chance here, which had been the story of Chelsea's night. I must say. They were so toothless. They'd created plenty of scoring opportunities, but just not managed to really get the quality of shot away that they might have done, particularly given who they have up front. Yeah, well, the way Arsenal should have, you know, easily beaten Bayern, I suppose, all the chances they created. Leon should have done the same with Chelsea last night. In the first 10 minutes, the visitors should have been miles ahead. Like, with Chelsea were going into this game 1-0 ahead. But Emma Hayes said afterwards, celebrating the victory, the manager said Chelsea players just lacking confidence at the moment. They're not playing too well. So they had to really get through this and it was all about perseverance. And how often do you see champions do that where they're not mm. really playing well in springtime and yet in summer they have all the trophies? I know we'll talk in the fire pit later about some maybe sporting phrases we don't like, but can a penalty be soft and also a penalty? Like, are they mutually exclusive? Can, can both things exist at the uh, same Well, time? there is a grading, but That's equally it's yeah. either a penalty or it's not. And for me... Like ultimately, while it didn't look like that in the first viewing, mm. you know, once the VAR calls the referee over to have a look at the TV, you know which way this is going. Mm. And like it was, it was a little clip. It was fairly foolish on the Leon defender's behalf because she actually just exactly just doing nothing. She was sort of half shepherding away didn't from goal even anyway. Really tackle her either, though. I mean, like it is, clumsy. it is really that it's well clumsy. Yeah, maybe. Like she got too close to her, but it wasn't even a tackle. It was mm. just you know, James's leg connected with hers. But it, like you've seen those penalties given so often these days. It went to VAR, so it wasn't given originally. Yeah. Mm. So you're talking a few years ago, Chelsea would have been out of the Champions League. I don't think any... You would have about VAR. Yeah. There was also a bit... Of, uh, the shithousery out of Leon around the penalty in extra time was incredible. So um, Ingle and um, uh, Mielda, who took the penalty in the end, did that trick of, which I've seen recently, but I couldn't remember exactly who it was. Holding the where, ball. Where uh, Ingle held on, held on onto the ball as if... You know, to take all the heat. Aaron, Aaron Trippier did in. it for Isak for at Newcastle. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then had the last second handed the ball over to Miel <laughs> to have, have the go. But actually, what happened at that point was the Leon players started encroaching into the penalty box and delayed the thing by another about three minutes, yeah. which was really sort of obviously putting the pressure on the penalty taker. But you managed to hold her nerve to bury it. But it, absolute shit housery on them. Yeah. And, and actually, Leon funnily part. enough, uh, another pre-show topic today was Phil Egan in the office saying uh, that that's exactly what we should talk about in today's fire pit is the increased S-housery around penalties. Oh, yeah. And how frustrating it is that when 
that when a penalty is awarded that it takes so long for it to actually be taken and it seems to be Are we not allowed to say the full expression is that? Oh. Well I just said I won one less curse wouldn't do us any harm mm. Wouldn't do us any You're harm You're just not as sharp as you normally are called my field this morning what do you think Shane he's uh, a bit like yeah, just, yeah. he's not quite I, I don't know what it is I wasn't yeah. It's just something there's a slight edge What's like missing? he's normally he's, he's witty he's sharp yeah. he's intelligent smart uh, well, well. Are you, doing you know work? like all of those, it just feels this morning. I'm not saying he's not not still all those things. Just ninety five percent of himself. I should oh, at seven twenty nine and fifty five seconds. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to mention it. I won't even mention it. Oh really? Because you've I, been banging on for the last twenty four <laughs> hours about well, how much time. Tell, tell everyone. I won't mention it. Tell everyone what we're talking about here. I won't mention. No, it's up to no, you now. If you'd no, like, to, if you'd like to mention it, no. Then. The only reason, the only thing <laughs> I want to say, the only thing I want to say, is that caffeine addiction is crippling. Yeah. It really, well, if if you'd like to mention it now, go ahead. And I'm suffering from it right now because I'm I'm having to withdraw. I'm fasting until late morning I have to get blood tests later on I can't have anything today and usually I'd be two coffees in now or I'd actually be having a coffee as be, we speak you'd be two in at the stage well I'd, just, I'd be one and a half I guess oh wow yeah 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 yeah. yeah. it's not great not what I'm saying like, this is not good and, and what happens for the rest of the day you say, you... one more after the show and then if it's really bad if I've loads on another one ah on stop that's well that's four. doing you no good at that's it no and these never. are all machine like these, there's no like uh, there. none of your Nescafe Braeburn sort of coffee Braeburn so yeah, yeah full on yeah. coffees yeah and uh, I mean, I, I, I love Braeburn coffee, obviously, but um, four of them is a, is a whack. I had a conversation there with Johnny Ward, who everyone would be familiar with out there, um, often on the show. And he said there's no such thing as having too much coffee, he believes. Mm, that's not true. Now, Johnny Ward, is, he's, a, he's a loose guy. Like, you know, but that's I, pretty. I, I, like, I mean, I don't want to... I like uh, I, I like, sometimes I like his ideas. I used know? to work with a chef at like home in Monaghan who won't, won't be named, but he, he has, uh, used to take like maybe 20, 25 cups of coffee. Never Maguire. <laughs> it wasn't. Him. We'll call him Ed McGuire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, wait, that's too we'll obvious. Him. Never him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know how people do it. Yeah, two, yeah, two max for me in a day. Two max. Two is max. It. Well, be, be, uh, before I uh, took the, uh, this job in this company, I was one a day. One a day. You know what I mean? Wow. So I've increased my consumption four times. There's a lot to be said for a ca- for a green a peppermint tea. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, green tea said. is apparently a very good substitute. Is it? Yeah. Now, I haven't read the comments yet. Are there any comments? But I can feel people are either going to be very on board at this conversation or move on. Want us to go back oh, to I'd say, I'd nobody's coming to get it, which is a sure sort of um, oh, that's, sign that's, that's that's that nobody's going to hoot about it. Dara Tool says that he can't wait for me to answer everyone else's questions uh, once the answers are given in the crappy quiz later. <laughs> Thanks for your support there, Dara. Actually, <laughs> what, you'll th- what you'll find is what I've taken to doing because of um, people like your good self, Dara, I've taken to writing the answers down so that I can end say no I actually had it here um, it's going to yeah. be very um, you know I look I believe the crappy, there will be a crappy quiz later on and I'm not going to start pre-moaning about the crappy quiz mm. um, but it's coming from a uh, genuine place you know yeah. Owen um, McCarthy has a good slot for us what he says off the brew oh it's not like bad it. don't know what it is it's like partridge in the pear tree don't know what it is, know what it is. Yeah, yes. it's a good go. name though that's not bad no we'd load the sport <laughs> Superb penalty under under severe pressure, says uh, the what, Jamie Dominic. Yeah, we actually that, haven't yeah. talked about the penalty itself. Her two penalties both in the shoot in the shoot, both same side, different heights. But I mean, to go top left in a ninety or sorry, five minutes into additional time and extra time in the Champions League quarter final, um, it's incredible. I feel we should mention Shane Long as well. Yeah. Um, so we'll do that for anybody. This sort of emerged out yesterday evening that uh, Shane Long had been speaking on the uh, K and Ash Share Your Voice podcast. Uh, Ash, uh, sorry, Kay being his wife, Kaylee, and um, he sat down for a conversation about the end of his days with Ireland and how all that uh, has apparently unfolded. Mm-hmm. Um, strong, aren't they? A lot of stuff. Very, very strong words. And he talks about um, the critical of Stephen Kenny and his man management around this, which I would have always thought seemed to be come to the fore as um, mm. one of his really strong, his strong points. And there seemed to be a lot of logic. Look, you don't know what's going on uh, behind the four walls, of course. But um, he says that he uh, Stephen Kenny had a really good idea to bring himself, Darren Randolph and Seamus Coleman in and present jerseys to some of the newer players who had arrived into the squad. Um, and he thought this was a really nice touch. And as they came in, uh, they were Darren Randolph presented his jersey to Cuevin Kelleher. Seamus Coleman presented his jersey to... John Egan or no uh, O'Shea and these sure, were like yeah. high numbers yeah. so they were like squad numbers and then uh, Shane Long was asked to present the jersey to Adam Eda, which he did and then opened up the jersey and it was number 9 and Shane Long feels very strongly that this was not uh, you know you have to work he had to work to get the 9 jersey off after Kevin Doyle retired and now you have to Adam Eda should have had to work to get the jersey off him and that there was no conversation around it in advance and he was fuming he said it was late in my Ireland career so obviously when you come into the ranks you get a high number uh, and then he talks a little bit more about that where was the strong stuff particularly 
towards the end, wasn't it? This year. Uh, Stephen Kenny called me into the squad. Um, I had a little speech saying how proud I was to make my first appearances when he was uh, presenting the jersey to Adamita, just introducing them to the team, which I thought was a great idea. Um, and then he mentions Coleman and Darrow Shea. And then I stepped up, it was Adamita. I was delighted because he's Cork City. He's a bit of a culture like myself, a young guy, big potential. I gave a speech, I held up the shirt, and on the back it was number nine. I remember just handing that jersey over and I just wanted to storm out of that room. If it was at club level, I would have left. That would have been me gone. I didn't want to take away from Adam. That was uh, a manager making a statement. I rang Kayleigh. She was my sounding board and she was raging as well. Adam hadn't made an appearance for Ireland. He hadn't earned that shirt. Um, it was a traditional way you had to earn that number in the squad and to have it taken away, handed over like that was embarrassing and degrading. I spent so many years trying to earn that number. It was uh, one of the lowest and I didn't want to take away from Adam. Went straight to the kit man and asked him who picks the numbers and he said the gaffer. That's, it's that bit about been uh, embarrassing and degrading. Very strong. I can see I can see both points of view here. I understand that footballers have egos and, and for a player of, of Shane Long's experience, wearing the number nine jersey probably meant a lot to him. As he said there, meant a lot to him to get the number nine jersey in the first place at international level. But I, I kind of, I'm kind of thinking, just you're an experienced player, it's a number on your back. Get on with it. Just get on with it. Forget about it. Mm. It's not that big a deal, really. I understand the strikers have egos especially. I do understand that. Um, but, I mean, <laughs> Stephen Kenny did that for a reason. He obviously knows Adam Eda's personality as well. Maybe that he'd get a kick out of wearing the number nine jersey and maybe that might push him forward. I don't know. But I think for, for a player of Shane Long's perspective, whether you're wearing 17, 99 or anything in between, like it doesn't matter. Just mm. get on with the game and get on with playing in the squad and being an experienced member of the squad. Sounds like he did that anyway and he, he parked it and said, I'm not going to let this ruin my international career, one person. So... I think Shane Long had the right attitude about it, but the number on your back doesn't really matter. Why did international players start getting squad numbers? Well, I think they do, but at the, at the outset of a camp. No, I mean, they do, but when did that start? Because mm. this this wouldn't be an issue otherwise. Because um, it used to be one to eleven. It's not like, that recent. It's not that recent, is it? No, it's not that. Yeah, but I was just wondering. There was there was a time because if you look at two thousand and two World Cup, Damien Duff wore number nine. Mm. for that tournament yeah. which is very unusual for mm. an out and out winger as he was at the time to play number now he did play up front in that tournament but he eventually got number 11 but it used to just be your starting 11 and then whatever was left over for the subs mm. so this is the problem when you start giving people squad numbers yeah. and also you have to be really careful about who you choose as your number 9 internationally was Shane Long ever the proper candidate for number well, 9 he did say that players covet their numbers which I wasn't aware of well, Vinny, so, so Vinny, you have to take that as red yeah, right? so that's the thing that's just the thing. So we've established that. And in that context, like I certainly take what you're saying, Shane, but I also think that Shane Long has proven over a long number of years to be a pretty honest broker and like yep. not one of these guys, I think, like you say, like of good character, I think, might yeah. be what you would, uh, how you would describe that. So I almost sort of, I certainly, my initial reaction was, oh, is this such a big deal? But then I just thinking about it a bit more, coming from an honest broker, he's obviously felt extremely hurt by it was Stephen Kenny using it as a, as a motivation? Mm. If he was, would you not sit down with him afterwards and go, listen... Or beforehand and say, this is a, the number I'm Well, giving. beforehand, you lose the motivation because then you're not delivering the hammer blow. But I, t I do take that point. You could have delivered it beforehand. You could have sat down with him afterwards and said, listen, this is your message now. Is the, what's this, the hammer he's, blow He's is, taking your jersey. What are you going to do to take it back? The hammer and at that point, you have a fired up striker who's ready to go and you can't be you can't be catching him off guard opening up the jersey and seeing the number nine at that, that point that probably was, wasn't ideal that's yeah. why I think the discussion beforehand maybe is important if any person said last week he, he was annoyed or not annoyed he was surprised that Evan Ferguson wasn't given the number nine jersey in the recent window I think mm -hmm. he was given 17 certainly against 19, Lafayette he was wearing yeah. or 19, 19 sorry yeah. and Vinny was kind of bringing that up as a, as a as a potential talking point either the number well it's pressure you see that's the thing that's pressure yeah. again from a Stephen Kenny point of view you're thinking about what number I'm going to give him here it's a bit of pressure if you give him the nine jersey because, like, if he needs to be dropped in a couple of games, then suddenly it's. Mm. We obviously felt Ida was deserving of at that time. Yeah. So it, Evan Ferguson, I mean, is, is clearly deserving of whatever jersey he wants. Mm. I would, numbers are definitely pressured, or sorry, uh, precious to elite players because Edison Cavani was number seven, at Manchester United in his first season at the club, and then Cristiano Ronaldo came back and he was given number twenty one. Yeah. Wasn't happy with it. It's a status thing. It's not actually the number. Oftentimes, I would say, and in Shane right. Long's case, it's. His position in the Irish squad and starting lineup was precarious, and he probably felt that going into that camp anyway. When he was going to do this presentation for Adam Eda, he was probably still thinking, "Geez, am I even going to start here with all these players coming through?" And then the number nine jersey is switched over. The other way to look around it is, is Evan Ferguson upset that he's not number nine? No. Yeah. I, 
I would doubt it. Yeah, but at different points, you're 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 a different person at the end of your career. Like he's saying himself, it was the tail end of his Ireland career. His days were coming towards an end anyway. He was going to be. I mean, I'm 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 um, projecting a lot of words here, mm. but like he was going to be a bit of a bit bar player, wasn't he, for Ireland at that point? That but he still accepted. Shane Long could still come out back into an international squad. Well, I'm not it's sure. On, it's on, I'm not sure. Well, no, but it, Stephen Kenny left it open. I think. You know, when he was I last. I think after, after those minute. words, now that feels like this feels like the possibly no return. But I mean, I mean but yeah, and like you know, I'd say from Shane Long's point of view as well, he's probably looking at a lot of those players that come in. Is he? Is he probably looking at that going? Am I not at least as deserving a place here as whatever? Like, you know, yeah, some of the players that have come in there. Yeah, and I I do understand it from Shane Long's perspective, and I'm I'm surprised by the emotion of the quotes, but mm. I, as in like that he went ahead and said that. So I suppose like it's a comfortable setting in a podcast and you're going to say what you really feel which is that that's the greatest thing about the emergence of podcasts you really actually do hear from players mm. what they think but like he was very much as part of the Irish setup for the previous couple of years before that happened yeah so I understand it from his perspective and yeah. it was a vulnerable position that he was in like but for Stephen Kenny it was interesting and I well, I suppose we'll never find out really if it was in I his time he, I challenged he, he, along he will get asked or was it like I, Kenny will I'm get disregarding asked. you I'm he disregarding get, you he will get asked about it there's no question and I do get the like there is a status thing amongst players you know yeah. like it's, when he says embarrassing I'm sure he means embarrassing uh, amongst his teammates who are all looking at him going in his mind oh but that's your jersey and now you're literally handing it over to somebody else so I do get that there is a little bit of do understand that uh, quirky kind of captures it here he says I don't think Shane Long would have minded if Kenny had explained beforehand it's not about ego it's more about communication and culture but he would have minded he said that in the quotes he would have been raging but at least he would have had time to process mm. there was the video that was last year of when Koulibaly was joining Chelsea of him ringing John Terry, John Terry and yeah. going can I wear the number 26 because nobody had worn the 26 since Terry had left and it was like can I please wear it and Terry gave him his it's for a blessing. That's right. Uh, so there's a little bit of pomp and ceremony around the numbers. That's right. For some people, and obviously the number seven jersey, teams like Liverpool and Manchester United has historical yeah, meanings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of number seven, this obviously lends itself to odd numbers and uh, unusual players. Jamie Damakin, who starred yesterday with the GMAC request, of course. come in again today with Cheers another that, belter. Jamie. Appreciate that. Matt Doherty wears number seven, which is a crime against squad numbers. That's true. <sighs> then you're getting to... We're, William Gallas is number 10 for Chelsea. <sighs> Khaled Boularouz, anyone remember him? Yeah. For Chelsea, number nine. But it, that, kind of, that, kind of excites, that kind of excites me. Number That's, nine. Who cares? Pretty interesting. So you don't care? No. So why does Shane Long? Because I, his teammates. Again, yeah. His teammates. It's so. It's not the number. It's the. I like you know like I'm and, and his vulnerability. It's like, my birthday's on the twenty first. So I, I I used to like wearing the number twenty one. I used yeah. to or I like I used okay. to like players wearing the number twenty one. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, and then you wouldn't mind if it didn't become the twenty one because it's not like a yeah. status thing. Exactly. Um, oh, Samarano, yeah. With uh, Isolt, uh, Cody Gamorty Isolt, Cullum should have moved to Matcha. Caffeine energy without crashing or adrenal glands needing the break. Didn't think this is what I need to be tweeting about today. Uh, to what is ostensibly, the week that's in it, ostensibly a sports show. It's ostensibly, we, yeah. We, we sometimes talk about other stuff. We do. Well. It's, a, it's important to get the coffee in. Um, but yeah, certainly if there are alternatives that don't lead to the shakes. I'll start getting the shakes after. I'll take one in the morning before the show usually and then maybe one at about half ten, eleven 11 for a stroll after the show. Yeah. But th- nothing beyond that. I used to get a headache if I wasn't getting enough coffee. Really? At that point, I realised I needed to go cur- cold turkey for a while. Yeah. Decaf coffees as well. That's, I, 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 have I, I Decaf, I must say... Pointless. I ju- I, 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 uh, I'm reticent to go too hard here. But my natural instinct is, what's the point like? Huh? What's that all about? He's so not even listening anymore. His, the energy has gone so well, I low. Do the, the other job. Did you hear even what I said? Yeah, I did, yeah. Th- there was a fire, uh, viral video of the Mayo lad. Was it Mayo lad yesterday talking about the 16 points? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. What's the point? Yeah. In the two points. Well, so you're saying, what's the point in well, the... Well, a very different take that the, I'm... Totally that different, have, but, but, but what's the point in the, the like, decaf? I do love said. coffee and I love the taste of coffee. I love the experience of coffee. So decaf, you get the taste, no? But at the same time... That's a good way to put it. I just... I just... I don't know... The experience of coffee. That's I don't true. know that. Um, <laughs> Callum's going through it over there. He is. He's going through it. I just don't know. I just. I think when you're drinking it, then you're like, well, I'm not really. You also want to get the caffeine hit. Let's face it. I, it would be, before I moved to Dublin, I barely looked at a cup of coffee. But it also goes to show that the last seven or eight years, there's Where been an absolute. That? There's been an absolute boom. Be at home. There's been an. Ab- Came no, up to Dublin. You were like, I'm going to try loads of coffee. Like, is that it? Sorry. Did they not have uh, coffee down in Cork? Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying no but this goes to my point is it just me or 10 years ago coffee wasn't a thing did you move thing. up to Dublin when Co- you were 18 coffee, I can tell you what, 10 what years age? ago coffee was a thing coffee wasn't what, a thing what age though? did you move to Dublin coffee at? wasn't a thing oh what age were you what age was I yeah 
twenty. Yeah, so like five. Oh Jesus! Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think so. I think so. Okay. But um, wow. tell me this, everyone: is it just me or? Is coffee? Coffee was only kind of an instant thing at home. You'd have and it in the jar, back to a house or whatever you're having. But now it seems in Dublin, like every other, every other shop or every other third shop is a cafe. No, like coffee has exploded. I think, exploded I think that in that's this the same way that when you grew exploded. up, certainly when I grew up, like I had, uh, you know, I had about four or five meals that I had in rotation for the first. 18, 20 years of my life and then I never had anything else and yeah. I realised other food exists. Is that the same thing with coffee? I do That's think a car, I think it actually coincides at the time that there was a coffee explosion in this country. Jo- uh, Johnny Ward, I mentioned him again, he was on there recently saying that he went to Italy and, you know, would no, be known for its coffee. Mm. Not a patch on what you get here. That we have world class coffee. Mm. Speaking of world class, oh, yeah. the coffee here yeah, is world yeah, class. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and it's just everywhere. You can't move for it. The espresso thing, I don't really understand because that's just that's just someone who loves caffeine. That you, you don't really like. The well, taste you of see, coffee there's, there's like um, you'll probably reach a point in life, Shane, where you're like you don't really want to consume a whole pile of milk yeah. in your uh, in your diet, where you're actually looking at what you're consuming. It's true. Yeah, and yeah. so you know, I think it's an important discussion. Coffee, you know. Oh wow, look at that kind of nice. Uh, Nigel Gallagher, though. Um, I think this sums it all up. No, no, sorry, you, you won't. You won't read it out, Colm. So I'll read it Especially out. Especially the coffee has exploded. Bob Bob Dwyer, our, our friend in OTBM here, says Colm is the Moussa Dembele of OTBM. Doesn't get the credit he deserves. Keeps things ticking over, and as well-rounded sporting knowledge akin to Dembele's ability to beat the first press. That's a nice comment. Spectre Course says we have the parchy sung of coffee, which would be the top tier coffee. Yeah, obviously, it would What's be world, the world class. Eleven of world coffee class, top tier. I know a man who likes coffee. Yeah, good segue. 7.52, Colm, thanks, William, for... Um, especially so this morning. Especially so this morning. We, myself and Jim and the audience very much appreciate you making the effort because yeah. that must have been very hard for you. It's the show I love. It's what I do. Mm. Uh, right, 7.52, ought to be end with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave of your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Here's what's coming up. Ron Nagara, as uh, Colm has alluded to, is standing by. Anna Capeless is going to look ahead to uh, the Ireland-France game in Cork tomorrow at 10 past 8 this morning. Shawnee Johnston will look ahead to the league finals this weekend. We'll have our Friday fire pit. And uh, Jess Kelly is coming to the studio at 10 past nine for a slot that she promised about a month ago where I'm going to do something to do with virtual reality oh. headset. I, I, you don't I know much can't about it. figure how this is going to work in a broadcast environment. It's like the toy show. This is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Merry Christmas. And then Rafa Hanningstein, who was uh, in conversation with Nathan last night. So that's all coming your way today. Do keep the comments coming into us, whatever's on your mind this morning. Ronan Agara, good morning to you. Morning. Hey, Shane. Morning, how are you doing? Very good. How are you? Good. Where are you at at this point of your week? You've Gloucester, obviously, at the Stade Marcel de Flandre tomorrow evening. Uh, Heineken Cup round of 16. Where are you at in terms of planning now? Is it, uh, you know, the turnaround from last weekend? Everything done and dusted, signed and sealed, and we're ready to go? Or, yeah, where are you at? Never like that. Never, never really like that. Um, so, yes, there will be kind of the big hit out of the week where you try and go at high intensity for... Um, a 20 minute period or 25 minute period and then um, review that I suppose this morning uh, as as a coach and then present those findings to the players all around. We'll train as close as possible to kick off time um, tonight uh, for a final little um, jog through, captain's run we call it, you know, so um, you do that 24 hours before kickoff. Um, in potentially a similar conditions you can create for your team. Uh, so hopefully tomorrow you transfer what you've been working on um, throughout the week. Um, yeah, a lot of energy during the week. A, a big result last weekend in the top 14. Give boys confidence, but it's always a fine line between uh, getting your prep done and um, I wouldn't say respecting the opposition, but uh, we were probably had that fear factor against Bordeaux, so we were on edge. And uh, it's a big derby game, forty-two thousand people, fantastic soccer stadium. Ireland, I think, play Romania there, first game of rugby world cup. Uh, surface needs to be improved a little bit. It's a soccer surface where couldn't take the scrums. Um, so, uh, but a beautiful stadium, uh, great surface, um, fast game. So. Um, from that point of view, uh, you know, you're not boxed off and I wish I could go drink coffee for, for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got, good, you've got good coffee there, Roger. Connoisseur, at, yeah. At the very least. Yeah, it is a great topic, though, as you say. I think, um, especially in coaching, I think, and if you ask any of the coaches, it's 
their number one. It would be high on the priority list of what gets them through a week, a day, whatever is it, 8.55. I've already had two flat whites. I've had nothing to eat, but by the time 3 o'clock comes, it'll be hitting 8 to 10, you know. Would, would you find, Ronan, um, so that when you have all the prep done and not, clearly the coffee helps uh, in doing that, but you can almost relax at that point? Like, would you sleep Would you sleep better the night before a match now or, or when you were a player? Um, oh, it's very, very different, I mm. think. I don't think uh, when you're a player you understand the levels of tiredness that a coach can feel. You know, it's very, very different. Sleep is a huge factor as a player and very important. You get your rest right, you get your recovery right. As a coach, it's over, you're finished. You know that, I mean, I'm not playing here, so mentally you have to be very sharp, obviously, but uh, there are days there literally when... Um, by the time you kind of put your head in the pillow, you're gone. Mm. While other times, there, you know, I mean, it takes a while to get to sleep because the mind is very active. But there's been some days, especially Sunday, Mondays, you're you're shattered. You just need to go to bed and can't wait for the next day. And hopefully, you're feeling better than you did when you went to bed. Mm. Um, just on on the game this weekend, so um, and I was just interested in your point about the fear factor against Bordeaux. So, like for people who aren't uh, familiar with it, Gloucester squeezed in as the final team in Pool A uh, with the final round win over um, was it Bordeaux at that time? They had the final round win. Yeah. The, it was a Bordeaux, yeah. yeah. And uh, in the Premiership, it doesn't make pretty reading there. They've um, um, a big a big job of work to do to to try and steer clear the relegation places there as well. It, I was reading some of the quotes with Jonathan Dante during the week. It just on on your point there about the fear factor. It seems like you've put a big focus on ensuring that that creep of well we should win this doesn't become a factor on the day for the players. Yeah, because we've already seen it three times. So you, Adrian, you don't need any more proofs than that. You know, we got smashed by Poe at home. We got beaten by Bordeaux at home. We got beaten by Leon at home. So if you we're in an interesting study, I would think, in the fact of where are they coming from. And uh, I mean, there's obviously no talk in those weeks that that opposition uh, will get what they want in the Flanders, yet they did. And we're in that territory now where one game beating us can save a team season. So that's very attractive from our point of view because we know that we've got a big target on our heads, but that, that changes when you're European champions. So uh, we got to accept that, we got to embrace that, we got to love that, and, um, and we're ready for that. Uh, what's been good in the last few weeks is the fact that uh, we've assumed that status and we're ready to fight on two fronts. And you got to remember that this started last August, so from August to March, there's been a lot of hard yards. Now we need to uh, enjoy this territory enjoy this opportunity and show what we're capable of playing I presume that um, in terms of that that complacency bit I presume that like your the ideal scenario for you is that some of your senior players stand up in the room and go listen uh, we need to be on our toes this week you look at the quality players that are there Ludlow, Morgan Harris, Twelve Trees uh, Reese Samet Johnny May there's like a quality there you're looking for some of your players I presume to stand up and drive that culture is that how it manifests itself? Or? Yeah, well, yes and no. You know, you, you've got a poor culture if you're looking for your players to get up and speak about complacency. That that doesn't exist, you know. I think that's what separates, the, I suppose, the internally motivated players, the self-driven players, to other players that need motivation or inspiration from a coach. And that's not a weakness on their behalf, but it's just uh, we go again every week and that's where... Uh, good players become great players. Their capacity to start again at zero and prep, prepare very well and get their performance. But at the same time, they're not robots and they have emotions and they have family and they have uh, external issues sometimes. And that's why they're never always on. But you're hoping that, you mean, 15, 16, you're 23 are on and that's good enough to carry you over the line from, from uh, week to week because the challenge every week is very different. The opposition is very different. But... Um, that stuff about culture and behaviour is isn't fixed by talking. It's fixed by acts and consistent behaviours, and that's uh, where we're getting better at, and why it's becoming very enjoyable to be part of this, I suppose, setup. What are they? Can I ask you, Ronan? The behaviours. Yeah. Well, I think we measure ourselves on our values. Our values are established by 
not the club but by the players the club would have their own values the players would have and the team would have their values and we measure ourselves with them and i think it didn't really come down to to rugby against bordeaux it came it came down to measuring up against those values that you know what i mean i'm not going to obviously give you them uh what we measure ourselves with but it's very understandable for people to understand what i am talking about so we just have a look to see do our behaviors measure up to our acts on the pitch and they did last weekend but they didn't in poe at home they didn't in leon at home they didn't at bordeaux at home so you could add gloucester to that list and it wouldn't be a surprise uh to me if they are added to that list if we don't get our preparation or transfer on the pitch right it's very very easy but uh, when you're looking at that from a coach's point of view, you you have to be on alert, but also know that if we do this, this and this correct, we have a great chance of performing well. That's that's fascinating when you talk about the psychology and 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 you forget that they're they're professional sports people, but they're human human beings with with emotions as well. And that word complacency, as you, as you say, like when you come off the back of a thirty point win away from home, you know people look and from the outside in are like well there has to be complacency there now because yeah I love, such I a big love win, but psychological battle I love that understanding of what goes on in the mind I just think that all the players have brilliant physical attributes sorry not brilliant but uh, to a certain level but then the great unknown is the, is the mental battle and that's what separates all the teams the capacity to not break first sometimes to not even uh, seek something else. It's to not break first. And what does not break mentally first would be, I think, explained very differently by a lot of different coaches. But uh, it, it's just the body will go where the mind is telling it. But if the mind doesn't want to go, you're going to break or someone's going to break. And that's mm. the weakness where you get a soft shoulder, you come up with a, an ill-disciplined play, you, you force the referee's hand in terms of holding on, it's either three points or kick to the corner, pressure for the opposition. There's all these mini moments throughout the game, but a lot of people focus on the end of the game while let's start quick, let's start fast, let's set our tempo. And um, that's why um, with 23 people starting, sorry, included in the game, they all see it very, very differently. And when you speak different languages and you come from all different corners of the world, it becomes very, very exciting because there isn't enough time for discussions and uh, there isn't enough time um, to hear everyone. But you want those discussions to happen because that means that the players are able to be themselves. If players are able to be themselves, they can express themselves. If you're trying to play to play in a setup that he's not at ease with, you're not going to get the best out of him. And those external factors that you mentioned, that, that's something that, that isn't considered by by media or by fans. A lot of the time, like you forget that, as you say, these players sometimes are, you know, maybe they're having a, a week of bad sleep, there's stuff going on at home, they're stressed about something else that we don't know about. So, like, a lot of it, I guess, for you is man management. It's, it's, it's being aware of those things. And a lot, of, a lot of people talk about Alex Ferguson and how he... He was a manager as opposed to a coach, left the coaching to other people. But, but that dealing with human beings is, is such a crucial part of the job and knowing what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. And there is always, you know what I mean, because there's whatever, 70 people between players and staff, there's always external factors and some of them are quite serious. But what the experienced players or senior players are, uh, people, they're able to park some people aren't able to park the external issues. Other people are. Some people find that it just eats away at them and it gets them and swallows them up. And once you've had those discussions with them, you can completely understand And There's a reason. It's where the player may not have that confidence to approach you or a member of staff to tell them exactly what the story is. Uh, and it's probably very apt in terms of how it's applied to the general public in terms of mental health. A problem shared is a problem halved. We need to open up, we need to discuss, we need to chat, we need to tell me and we can help. And it applies to me as well when I'm having down periods. you gotta, you got to share these and you got to let people know because if you bottle it up, you're either going to explode or do something that will cause uh, hurt to you or your players. And, that, and that's what we want to completely avoid in high-pressure environments. 
You mentioned uh, Alton Delan in your piece in the Examiner this morning, and you're confirming that he's going to start tomorrow. Will you talk to us a little bit about the journey that he's been on? He's cooking by all accounts. Yeah, he's he's uh, found his his mojo. He's found his stride. Um, he had a big game last weekend, and uh, it's a perfect example of what's involved in a player leaving an environment he was thriving in that went to a, probably a stale end in Connacht and then uh, transferred over to France, doesn't know anyone, uh, can speak the language very well, new setup, um, uh, period of introduction, and then uh, that takes time. And I think um, there was probably periods at the start where I was going, uh, yeah, Ulti in a Connacht jersey and an Irish jersey isn't measuring up to, to what I, I saw in the past. But now, uh, bingo, the last month, yes, this is what I like. This is what really uh, appeals to me. And um, there was never any stress between the, the me or Ulton. There was only small discussions. But uh, it's a good learning for me too. And the fact that that's what happens when... I suppose a guy transfers from a different European country to another country. It takes time to, to find his straps, to get in with the boys and uh, find what works for him. Now, the final stage is just getting those performances and, and that's the level where we're at. And I'm pretty confident with, uh, I suppose, the fitness he has. He can go to another level as well. I was watching a, a replay of the Raymond Rule try from last weekend um, where you run the ball from behind your own goal line and uh, length of the pitch and, and over it goes. What? Um, uh, you're, you're, you're after a few whiskeys, are you? What game were you? Was it, or maybe, it was, maybe it was from a couple of weeks prior. It was actually a preview of the game that included a clip from a few weeks prior. In fact, now that you mention it, you're absolutely right, of course. Uh, you yeah, might know absolutely. these things. Yeah, was it against yeah, Rassing? Yeah, was it against That's Rassing? Me, okay. I need to get more coffees in. Sorry, what abuse are you giving me there? I'll shut up. <laughs> Go on, sorry. I need, yeah, I need to. I need to have a word of my line season. manager about that's um, even last season. I think was it even last season? season? Well, it's yeah. it's it's ruined my question in that case. But I'll ask you anyway. Um, it, there was so much chat last year about the nothing more, nothing worse than a belligerent <laughs> interviewer, as we know. Um, uh, the KBA is what I wanted to ask you about. And the keep ball alive. Um, um, philosophy is that still it, it got so much airtime a couple of years ago and it you know it seemed to sort of disappear off the radar at some point is that still a thing that you speak about or an, an approach that you have uh, of course yeah but that's um, one of many different philosophies in the moment in the fact that all that means is that's that's uh, crusader speak is just keep keep ball alive and LQB is lightning quick ball that's becoming a little bit uh, more in in, uh, in mode at the minute as well. So these are all buzzwords that happen. But like um, there are many teams or players doing KBA, but unfortunately they're keeping the ball alive by offloading to the opposition, which completely is the opposite of what you want, you know. So uh, what obviously if you fall to the ground and you create a rock, uh, everyone's talking about the escape speed of the rock ball, but to avoid rocks, you don't play off the ground. You keep the ball alive, so there are no rocks. So it's obviously faster than a rock. So that beats the speed of, I suppose, so many of the data analysts out there who are in, uh, engrossed in this rock speed. But uh, what the French are very good at is that they they don't uh, at times, and it was a always the key point of Axel when we played um, French teams is just make them rock and make them rock. They don't like rocking. Uh, so that's where uh, it's fascinating for us. We're trying to combine the the DNA of the French teams where they play out of the tackle to uh, something Joe Smith was brilliant at, coaching the rock. And, and uh, Donica Ryan obviously played under him. So he has a lot of good nuggets on that, so we're trying to marry the two of them at club level and see what it brings us. Uh, Jules Favre is your, your number 10 runner. I know he's another name you mentioned in your examiner column um, t- uh, this morning. but No, no, he's our number... Oh, sorry, but he kicked 17 points. 12, 13, 11, 14, yes. 
20. We all need to do our prep a bit better. Well, funny, we, we were talking about squad numbers this morning. <laughs> the importance of squad numbers as well. Funny, ironically enough, on the show this morning. But uh, kicked 17 points last weekend, and I think it's his, uh, you mentioned his 100th start for, for La Rochelle this weekend coming. Like, do you find yourself levitating towards the likes of Jules Favre in the squad because of because he's a kicker or, or it's it's like asking who's your favourite child you know you don't you don't no, say it. no it wasn't that it was just a, this is a guy who has worked extremely hard and it's a great example I think for, for younger kids and the fact too that this guy isn't a natural goal kicker but mm. he's, he's practice 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 and then you know I mean it, it for me it's reassuring that you can put a fella like Astoy on, on holidays and and call on Jules Favre to to goal kick uh, and he kicked whatever they were reasonably easy kicks but no kick is easy when it's your first time kicking really in that in front of 42,000 people uh, what gives me a lot of pleasure in the fact coaching this guy is to watching a guy progress in front of you and being open to learning and hoping to getting better uh, but having that great uh, smile when he comes in every day and in good form and a pleasure to be around. That's that's uh, why I like working with these guys. He um, he works hard at his game and he's getting the return for it. He's 24, I think, and he's 100 games for, for Stade Rochelle, which is great. Uh, Felix Jones, obviously, um, announced during the week, Ronan, that he's off to the England backroom staff at the end of the World Cup. Um, a guy that you obviously shared a dressing room with for three or four years at Munster. I remember... At that time, even before he had forced to retire, injure, injured the chat around his leadership qualities at that stage. And he's got some bloody CV at a very young age now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a, not a surprise, obviously. Felix is, a, is a, an insane competitor, loves it, loves talking rugby, loves getting the best out of people he work with. Uh, everywhere he's gone he creates great connections with the people he works with so i think the connection would be alan walters who was the strength and conditioning coach in munster who went on to uh obviously design the model for the war for south africa to win the world cup then he goes to leicester so he'd have the in on felix so uh, alan said yeah, i presume get this guy and now felix is poached to work with england which is a, a fantastic opportunity for him i think his family is in Limerick maybe still um, so it's obviously closer to home for him but um, keeps him at the top end of the game Yeah I'm sure hopefully we might see him back here at some point as well down the track Final one for me Ronan there was a, a lovely video that um, a lot of people will have seen uh, this morning from, from that came out of the game last weekend it was yourself and the, the ball boy during the match uh, caught on camera kind of a bit of teaching, technique Yeah a bit of, ta- bit of tackling technique and, and you kind of picked he um Stood up and you could see the look in the kid's eyes. He's absolutely buzzing that he's getting a, a one-on-one from yourself. That, that was a lovely moment. It's something that, that probably he'll remember forever, forever. Yeah, I do, you know, when you're there, you don't... Obviously, I've seen the image and it's pretty close up of the discussion, which is... <laughs> uh, he was... Uh, we, the chap prior to that, he had beaten my son in the in the under-13s when Bordeaux beat La Rochelle. And, uh, so he was... He was having a joke with me about that, and then he was uh, obviously a big fan of Jalibert, who was a brilliant player for Bordeaux. And uh, uh, I just said the big challenge for Jalibert at test level was to just he's got to keep making his tackles. And I said, "Are you are you a good tackler?" And he said, "Yeah, I'm a brilliant tackler." And I said, "Brilliant, <laughs> come on, show me." Uh, so it was because uh, you know he uh, he was. Um, a uh, lovely little kid, great, uh, great chat throughout the game with him, and you forget that that's a because my boys do it in in, in La Rochelle, you know, and it's it doesn't cost anything just to say how's your evening going or whatever, you know. But then the chat just happened naturally with him. We got chatting about all things and big fan of Jelly Bear, as I said, and uh, he is an exceptional player, a brilliant player, and um. I was just saying to him that, uh, yeah, you got to be Jelly Bear, you got to be like Jelly Bear, and you got to keep going. Jelly Bear's got to keep kind of practicing those tackles, and same for you. And uh, it was um, then he was talking about um, just that he didn't miss any tackles in his under 13 game against La Roche. <laughs> the technique was a bit high to begin with, and you had to say to him, listen, get low. No, no, it was just. <laughs> Because that's the thing too, you know, and if you get the hip bone, it's it's a knockout right. on one of our core players, Matthias Sadad, had uh, a bad KO in the game. 
uh, because he put his head the wrong side of the tackle, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think I was a little bit spooked by that, so it was just making sure that you get flesh between the knee and the uh, uh, and the arse, but you, the closer you go to the to the the hip, the, there's a f- guys with a few hard hip bones. Yeah. Gary Ringrose, of course, from a few weeks ago as well. Uh, enjoy the flat whites today. Good luck tomorrow. Catch up with you down the Fair track. Cheers, Ron. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Ronald Agar on the line there um, ahead of the weekend. Good to spend a little bit of time talking to about La Rochelle, which we don't often yeah. get the chance to do because we're in the middle of the Six Nations or there's other stuff going on. And yeah. So it's good to just um, spend a bit of time talking about La Rochelle. I was re- the problem was I read an article and within the article was embedded this clip. And in hindsight... Uh, of, course, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's me explaining my... Uh, oh, well, you got to the point of the question. to prepare, whatever yeah, what the yeah, expression yeah, yeah. is. Yeah. I got to the point of the question, which was totally irrelevant, but I went ahead anyway, Shane. That's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, Right, what are we doing? There's loads of stuff coming in about coffee. Um, of course, that's what everyone wants to talk about. Yeah, uh, Italian coffee being top tier, says the Franzi Brady. Mm. Um, what's the world 11 of coffee brands, says Zan- Zanzi, which um, I, you could easily swap in. That's like a Cullen Buig oh, oh, item right there. Written all over it. But but Cullen, Cullen spin on that would be, what's the, what's the best coffee 11 that nobody knows there'd be some other does an Ethiopia have the best coffee in the world oh or, does it really yeah, it's right? certainly it's certainly in contention I remember being in Tanzania after uh, humble break climbing Kilimanjaro <laughs> and um, we, we, we went and visited some coffee coffee farms fascinating to see how it's to see how it's grown and made so eye opening but I do like my coffee but yeah some people are obsessed with it as we as we found out this morning yeah I'm a little bit obsessed with myself I've, I have a favourite coffee brand in Dublin do you in fact yeah yeah. brand is in other, shop other other brands exist of course you do um, well, you haven't said it so yeah it's yeah yeah like it uh, yeah exactly a brand of coffee that's sold at various places um, <laughs> do keep the uh, comments coming into us this morning whether it's about the rugby or whatever else you're having yourself we have loads to come um, a little bit later on we'll be talking to Shawnee Johnston um, about a the league finals this weekend some really interesting yep. stuff there the return at Luxton and more as well we get Johnny's thoughts and all that. We'll have a Friday fire pit. Jess Kelly, Kelly is going to go back into the studio, and uh, I'm going to put on um, virtual reality gaming kit, and I'm um, going to kayak. I understand. I don't know how that's going to work for wow. you, but uh, I'm just going to sit here and laugh. Be here. Sorry, it's, it's all here. you. I mean the audience. I mean the audience. Sorry, yeah. Anything else? And you, Shane. But look, we'll, you can you can do commentary on it because I'm sure that'll be um, it'll be hugely entertaining. Yeah. Uh, and do keep those comments coming into us. Uh, after the ads, though, Anna Capeless is going to chat to us about Ireland Six Nations clash against France in Cork tomorrow. And during the ads, you're going to hear a clip from the Women's Six Nations show. Alison Miller and uh, the ever energetic Fiona Hayes in conversation with Richard during the week in the Six Nations show is with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. We're back after these. OTB AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. Glad to see the goalkeepers getting the benefit of the doubt. Um, <laughs> you always bit... get the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> 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 that is not true. Like, the it, I feel like the referees get together and have a meeting, right? I honestly think this happens. And in those meetings, they either have, okay, I want you to be quite lenient. I want you to give the goalkeepers the benefit of the doubt. I want you to punish, blah, blah, blah. Because it just seems to be a little trend that goes on. Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. Do you add in a little bit of gamesmanship? Do you just <laughs> want to slow things down in that respect or uh, when uh, between players or, or how do you go about that? How do you go about needling and annoying a team of that calibre? I think all of the above and I mean like you got to be smart and you got to like hit them hard and and it's not being dirty it's not being like bringing the game into disrepute or any of those things it's just being smart mm. it's like um, as you said you know it's it's even if you're an attack and you get a chance to clear them out of the rock and clear them hard or if you're tackling someone you're, you're holding them down the ground a little bit longer maybe then you should and you're you're making sure that you're there and you know you're keeping them on the ground and you're getting it back up on the line but you're keeping them on the ground and it's getting up hard it's you know hitting them hard and yeah like it is those things you got to do that it's it, it's a game of physicality and if you can um get inside their head physically but also a little bit of niggle stuff that that can all in a game where you know so much is in your head as well to get up for things 100% you do those things. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now.
And you can check out that full piece we go up to our YouTube channel as well. Delighted to say we're going to uh, look ahead to the game now in the company of the former Ireland forward, Anna Capelis. Morning, Anna. Morning, lads. How are you? Flying it. How are you getting on? Good. I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you ever get sick of talking about sport? No. <laughs> and then when we get sick of talking about sport, Anna, we get to talk about other stuff, it turns out. So that's, uh, that's all good too. <laughs> you're unreal, lads. No jeepers. Like, you're unreal. Like, whenever I listen to him, like, how do they know so much about every sport, in and out, every day, Ah, you're just, um, our egos, Anna. Our I egos. wouldn't confuse our knowledge of sport with our ability to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, as long as you don't confuse mine. C- certainly in my case. Come here, it, it, I hope Cork is going to be good to us tomorrow. I, uh, As a viewing experience last weekend, I sort of felt that like it wasn't pretty to look at and there might have been a floating audience who came in, particularly for the first half, and thought, right, well, that's me uh, done here. And that, there's obviously a danger of that. What are you, um, on the face of it, Tomorrow isn't going to be any prettier, but what are you expecting? Um, I'm hoping for a good Cork crowd, if for nothing else, like the people who've kind of stuck with women's rugby and, and been invested. And yeah, I think there's a danger that that you could lose kind of any momentum that might be coming across from, you know, the excitement around the men's Six Nations and the under 20s and all the rest. And um I know my, my, my sister texted me to say she was looking for tickets and that she and my other sister were going to go because the girls need all the support they can get. And like, that's lovely to, to hear, you know, mm. from, from someone I know. And I hope that others in the rugby community in Cork and kind of surrounding areas will feel the same in terms of rugby. Yeah, look, and, and I, I listened to bits of what um, Fiona and Ali were talking about and goodness, they know so much as well. They're, they're so brilliant. And, they were saying, and I really agree with them, that like defensively, if you can hold France out and kind of stem the flow and not make it kind of a situation where you're like, oh, another one, oh, another one. Like if you can really like, and and, and Ireland are well capable of that with the players that they have, you know, and, and you know, I've got, I've, I've been talking all week and, and in the lead up to Six Nations as well about Neve Jones, Sam Monaghan, Nicola Friday, like the big physical, Linda as well, Linda and Jungang, like the big physical players that we have that doesn't matter who the opposition is, they can put in massive hits and massive tackles. We didn't see it from them last week, so I actually am I'm taking that as like a, a positive in that Ireland didn't play as well as they could last week. So we know there's way more in them, especially defensively, and like big hits that those girls can put in where you, you know, you're making an offensive tackle that they got, you know, they got huge stats on that last year. The Irish girls did like big offensive tackles that really add something to your defense. And I'm just hoping for a, um, a good performance and whatever they work on this week, that they're able to deliver on that. And they're not going to be able to fix everything overnight, but whatever they've decided, right, this is going to be our um, bread and butter for this week put it into practice, we deliver on the day and next week we'll focus on something else. Alison was talking about that um, lack of physicality almost as part of mentality she was talking about her attitude I suppose and like that she was sure that we'd be better in that regard tomorrow. Like it felt surprising that we wouldn't be full on with in that whatever but anything else but like that your attitude or your mentality would be right going into that Wales game have you been part of squads before where you just felt for whatever reason it wasn't right in the day and then something within such a tight turnaround is uh, is fixable or what's your experience of that yeah and I think I I have and I think that it's kind of typical typical of us like of, of the Irish girls to kind of pull something out of the bag and then you're kind of like oh where was this last week? Or people watching would have been like, where was this last week? Or, but it's not as easy as that. And sometimes it's easy as, as easy as like when your back's against the wall and you've, you know, nothing to lose, essentially. You just go for it. And yeah, I've been in, in, I remember going to England and like, especially when it's teams like England and France and you know how, you know, physical they can be and how much, you know, they're, they're, they could potentially put on you if you don't deal with them defensively. I remember going to England a few years ago and we played like kind of really conservatively. And I think it was due to the fact that we were um, so kind of trying to focus on like, okay, let's not do anything wrong here. So let's just kind of keep, whereas actually you need to just go for it, like whether that's defense or attack. And I think you can, that's definitely something you can turn around because that's something you can fix within 
you know, you see that change from a first half to a second half. Mm. You can you see that change from the first 10 minutes to the following 10 minutes in a game, like physicality dropping in and out. And it comes from different moments in games that give you, you know, an inside spark. So if you can fix it in from one half to the next, you can definitely turn that around within a week. Yeah. It's fascinating. And even writing in, the, in Echo Live about... I guess the dearth of experience in the Irish squad naturally compared to some some countries. I think you made the point that Nicola Friday, the most experienced with with what twenty nine caps to her name uh, around this time. Mm-hmm. So that's something that that nearly has to be taken into context when we're talking about this Irish team that they are, in some cases, years behind other nations. Yeah, definitely, and you know, if we look at where we are now, and like if, if when we're talking, you know analyzing the men you know going and preparing for a world cup like this year and talk so much of the conversation around the six nations was with the world cup in mind so if we talk about the world cup that's coming up for for the girls in two and a half years and like ireland has to be there we just have to be there like there's no ifs or buts here um we what we're building now is is the experience and like there's already a lot of changes from last week to this week and that already is kind of like, yes, some of those changes are warranted and some of those are very, I was a bit surprised by some of them, but I just want to see like more consistency. And also there's more conversation around like sevens in, sevens out, whatever that means. But essentially like we have to start um, giving consistent like opportunities to players and like we only have the Six Nations. And and I was talking about the, the experience and the difference between teams in, con- in context of um, Sarah Hunter last week retired with 141 caps for England, the most English rugby player, uh, the most appearances of any English rugby player, men or women. And that comes down to, yes, how long she's been around, but also like the playing opportunities presented by the RFU like for that team, like how often they had tours summer tours november international six nations something else like the union was constantly looking for opportunities to play and ireland haven't and we've got to change that like i'm i'm here i'm actually flying out to madrid today because i'm going to go down and see the um uh i'm living in spain currently so i'm going to go down and see the four nations um uh tournament that they've got going concurrently so South Africa, Spain, USA and Canada are playing a two-game series last weekend and this weekend. South Africa played a game against Wales and Wales organised that with South Africa to get a game in before going out into the Six Nations. Why didn't Ireland get in touch with anyone? Spain, USA, Canada, like one of those teams to organise the same thing because last week like we saw a lot of kind of changing around of positions Um I know that looks so well, you know, like Hannah O'Connor came onto the pitch and, you know, when you've four back rows and one second row and all the back rows look at each other and they're like, who's going to go in? Mm. <laughs> maybe they didn't, maybe they knew, but I felt like that would have been me. Like, because that's the stuff that you do in a warm up game, not in your first game in the Six Nations. So I just, I, I just want to see way more proactivity and not just reactivity in terms of like, oh, other teams are doing it, so we should be doing it. Our, the RFU needs to be like, okay, more playing opportunities, games, 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 experience, like, and just full steam ahead into whatever is coming up. Be that WXV, World Cup, Six Nations, whatever. I just want to see us playing more. Yeah, because certainly, like, in terms of that change, like, there's, there's an awful lot of play here. There's the stuff that you're alluding to there, to there on the structural side, and then there's obviously at the minute for the coaching staff and the team that are there, the weekly churn of we've another game coming up, and like it definitely, what sprung to mind as you were chatting about the changes that have been there from the Irish point of view was the Warren Gatland comes into the Wales uh, camp late for the men's Six Nations, and he's every week new fifteen, new fifteen, chop and changing. From the outside looking into that, it was like, well, this guy doesn't seem to really know what he's doing. He doesn't be able to land on uh, what this 15 or at, and it feels a small bit like that. Talk to us about one of the, the Dan O'Brien, particularly maybe a 10, such a pivotal position, and like it's 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 um, the exact embodiment of what you're talking about. Um, over the last number of years, we just haven't been able to settle on a on an out half. But she did come on against Wales, obviously, and in some ways has the ideal skill set um, for a game like France, where she can kick a bit of territory and try and just release that pressure valve. When it when it inevitably comes on with with regularity, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Because there's no kind of shake your feeling on a pitch than when you're under the pump. And when we go to kick, we don't get the kind of release of pressure where they get a, you know, a line out for just as far back as where they had been uh, attacking from initially anyway. So I think that, yeah, they'll use her a lot and, and she'll, she can try different things. I like that about her. She's, she's brave. And I think that, you know, young players particularly bring in a kind of a, a braveness that, uh, you know, maybe you get, when you get older, you're a bit like, okay, I know what's going on here. So these are our plans where she's just like fresh into it. No, she's got some caps in, in, in Japan. And that's what that tour was for, you know, to discover these players and see what they can do. And this young, you know, a young heart like that coming in and, and uh, especially in such a key position like 10 is um, massive for her. And like, I'm really going to see her, to see her start and see how she controls it. And hopefully that, you know, almost almost like blissfully ignorant that you're like, I don't care who I'm coming up against here, France, England, whatever. I don't, I've no previous experience in this Six Nations setup, so I'm just going to play how I play. And I want to see that from her. And I think that her kicking was really good last week and, and uh, I want to see more of that from her. Saif McGrath is an interesting one, Anna. Like, I mean, debut last week, 18 years of age. I know she's very highly thought of up in uh, Derry and, and by everyone at Ulster as well. Um, but that was a tough experience for her last week because <clears throat> she seemed to be targeted almost by by an experienced Welsh pack um, and, and she's out of the team, she's back onto the replacements this weekend but it, it's a tough it's a tough awakening when you when you enter senior Six Nations rugby for the first time. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I was chatting earlier in the week about this that I'd love to see, what I'd love to see from Saif McGrath is her thriving in an under-20 side. Mm. You know, and we don't have that. We don't have that. And even, I was thinking about this earlier, because obviously um, uh, France are coming to Cork. And it's funny, like the, 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 French, the French women's team are kind of similar to the men's team. You never really know what they're going to come with. You know, when people say, oh, the French don't travel well and all these kind of things. But it's, just, it's because the French kind of, they either crumble or they thrive and, and, and it's so hard to know. But in terms of like... Um, experience and match day experience like when you go down to France <laughs> my first Six Nations away game was down in France and they give you the small dressing room they give you one toilet which isn't which doesn't even have a toilet bowl it's like that you know that hole in the ground <laughs> that you come across when you're on holidays in France sometimes in a, in a little old man's pub and it's like they're absolutely like messing with you and they they don't care and like that's one thing that they, they've taken out of France's hands this time around because they have to come to Cork and I, I don't think there's any holes in the ground down in Musgrave Park for toilets but all those things pre-game prep um and this is talking about, you know, I know you're talking about the match, but like all the things that lead up to the match. Imagine if you could experience all those as a team, as an under 20 side and then coming into a senior side without having to worry about even those things. So now you're talking about the scrum. Yeah, rude, like rude awakening, maybe baptism, baptism of fire. Definitely. She handled it as well as she could and they definitely target her. I would if I was if I saw a young player in another team, I'd target her. Uh, as well and like let's go for her like let's you know let's show her what it really means to be here like she she'll have learned from that definitely but on the pitch off the pitch just would love to see girls coming in that you know have been through this um in an under 26 nations mm. and I, I, I want to see that I want to see that down the line for us and and we should be looking at Saif McGrath like and how how she's performing with an under 20 side like wow i can't wait to see her like you know if, if, if you weren't watching the the interpros you'd never have seen her play before and so you'd only know what to expect from her even as a spectator um and she's uh you know she did as well as she could and now people are like oh she's on the bench so maybe you know maybe it wasn't the right call to start her last week i don't know um it's hard to know. I would prefer to see um, Christy starting, like the, the, the front row we have this week with Saif coming in. That's what I would have preferred to see, just to, to give her a bit of a... You see how the game is going and then you can come in and make your impact. Mm. But um, it definitely... I think, I, I think... I'm hoping that the scrum this week will kind of be... Uh, 
coming up against a French scrum, it's it's difficult, but it'll be slightly more settled, I think, because they'll have just a bit more experience on the pitch, off the pitch, leading into it and how to handle it and then how to react to it. And then Saif can come in when 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 it suits the management, when it suits the game and when it suits her. Mm. Uh, Shane mentioned earlier on your piece in the Echo this week a really interesting read on it uh, covers a load of bases around that leak of caps particularly from the uh, something that Stuart Lancaster talks about regularity about needing that breath of caps across the team um, it also talks about your own decision to step away um, and you spoke about the players and I'm quoting here who like me decided that they cannot continue to put their happiness self-worth and mental health in the hands of a union that's failed again and again to show the players the respect they deserve very strong words uh, yeah yeah and it was um, difficult for me to write that and put it out there, but um, it, it's it's essentially the the truth at the end of the day. And um, after, like, I had a kind of COVID didn't help, but for me, my my uh, whole international career was very like inconsistency, like in out, dropped, selected, playing well, thought I'd never play again, come back, get player of the match dropped again oh like so up and down and it was very tough it's just the nature of the way it went for me you know and there's players like that and and it just so ha- you know it just so happened that that was it for me and and when you know the, the new management came in and I got a call that said you know that that I wasn't going to be involved I was like I can't I can't continue to do this to myself like um mm. it was like torturous really L- lying awake at night wondering why 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 am i doing this like why i can't be myself you know and and people who know me and, and know like kind of um usually I'm, I'm i'm like dancing and singing and kind of whatever like i have have uh different things that i might bring to like a dressing room or to training or whatever but when you have to go into you know a, a, a camp and and kind of keep your head down and, and had to do that for so long. And I was like, I can't keep continuing to do that to, to, to myself because the selections were so, you know, you're doing everything to, to play. And I felt like even laughing at training might've lost me my spot. It was, it was so inconsistent, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, yeah. And I, I, I think a lot of people felt, for me i have to remind myself that it wasn't a it's not coming from a place of weakness it was coming from a place of strength for me to to finally say i'm not going to put my self-worth in the hands of anyone else anymore especially not in the hands of a coach who's not even going to give me an opportunity to to who just dropped me straight away without even seeing me um coming into the the come without inviting me into a camp so I, I just decided i can't and i stepped away and there's a lot of players like that who had the same thought process and took themselves out of the setup and and um went back to their careers or decided or haven't even taken themselves out of the squad and are still still not in there so um it's been a kind of a a facet of 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 the women's game in Ireland for the past few years and like we don't have when you look at Sarah Hunter and other players I know I'm using her because she retired last week but other players that have so many caps and just to have so many caps that aren't involved that could be um is is a uh, is sad for me I find that kind of sad yeah, that's totally understandable. And I think that, like, I'm trying to put my finger on whether it's, like, a structural uh, union thing or it's more of a management ticket thing. Um, like, have you any sense that the Women in Rugby report that came out at the end of last year is... I, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't sound like that's the sort of thing that it might uh, might address your concerns. Um, there's certainly a plan in place, and I've been... Um, you know, following and and um, seeing what's been going on, and it's exciting to hear you know a few things that are coming up for Ireland and like you know there's an under 18 Six Nations festival. It's like great, an under 18 Ireland 15s team, wonderful, and you know a lot of other things that are in the pipeline for our shall we? And I'm happy with that. I'm happy to see them coming, but I'm also very impatient and I'm I'm cynical and I'm I'm kind of. I'm already um, like, okay, fine, but I want to see it. Mm. And until I see it all in action and see the returns from it, I'm going to keep asking questions and, and keep feeling this way where I just want to demand more and um, I want more for the players and I want the players to be well looked after and happy and, and um, allowed to be themselves. And you're right, it's it's 
it's not you're not it's not easy to say whether it's a structural thing management thing whatever but it is a trend and yeah let's let's work in the report like great to see like all these appointments across the provinces for talent id and building the um the experience in the provinces for women's rugby but i'm gonna just keep hot on it to make sure that's happening and make sure that it's um happening well and i talk to the players a lot and i talk to a lot of people and i want to know about everything that's going on i don't want to it for me walking away from ireland rugby as a player meant that okay i've got nothing to lose now i can ask the questions that i want to ask um you know be the be, be the voice that maybe players don't have and, and express things that I would like to, to that I maybe would have liked to express as a player but you can't because you could lose everything in a heartbeat and um, I, I want to see it and I want to see it continue to grow and I'm, I'm going to be like watching very carefully to see how it does grow. The decision to step away while like it sounds like you're very happy with that obviously that it it's leaves you ultimately in a more rounded better place uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't still hurt. Sounds like it does. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy at the moment that I'm really able to enjoy these Six Nations games and and really like support the girls because last year I couldn't. I was in such a bad place. Um, I couldn't even follow the Japan tour. I was in. I was so broken hearted. Like I, I, I couldn't. So I'm, I'm really happy with where I am now, because I feel like yeah, I can contribute now. Um, but yeah, it does, and I, I, it does, it does still hurt, and I'm, I still have a lot of. Um, I suppose you'd call them regrets, but I'm, I'm not sure what I could have done differently either. And I think the, the comfort that I'm getting in it is that I want to be. I want to stay involved in women's rugby forever and I, I want to be a coach and I, I'm focusing on that as making me, you know, um, okay, if I, if I couldn't achieve it on the pitch, like how can I achieve what I want now? Mm. And it's too much of a cliche to say, well, that experience can, and ultimately that experience will probably put you in a better position down the track in terms of coaching and all that. But for now it doesn't, uh, it's, I'm sure it's no great um, consolation to you. Enjoy the, the rugby over the next few days um, and we uh, would definitely uh, welcome to have your voice back on here again to speak about whether structural issues are hopefully the aftermath of a win over France in Cork on, uh, on Saturday afternoon. Brilliant. Thanks a million, lads. Thanks a million, Anna. Thank, thank you. Cheers, Anna. 8.42 a.m. on this Friday morning's to p.m. Going to turn our attention to GA and uh, delighted to say the former Cavan star Shawnee Johnson is back with us on the show this morning. Morning, Shawnee. How are things? Morning, man. How are you? Keeping well. Keeping well. Uh, so we're looking at the fixtures here. Tomorrow we've got the Division 4 final <clears throat> at Croke Park. 5 o'clock, Wicklow and Sligo, followed by your, yourselves, Cavan for Mana uh, at 7.15. And then the Sunday doubleheader, of course, is the Division 2 and 1 finals. You've got Derry and Dublin at 1.45 and Mayo Galway at 4 o'clock. We might as well start with the Division 1 final, I suppose. Uh, Shawnee, um, uh, funny, Kean Johnson, who we work with, has been putting together a few notes. And uh, th- these two teams, their record in, in, in finals, national finals, isn't great. Galway have only won three of their last 13. Mayo have won two of their <coughs> last 20. Uh, and Galway not winning a league since 1981. Uh, who, who wanted more this weekend, Shawnee? It sounds like a stupid question, but Mayo have the, have the, of course, the championship to look to think of the following week. Yeah, but they've been forewarned, I think, about the pitfalls of not performing in a league final after last year. I think they got school last year by 15 points, 319 to 13 or something last year, and they never really recovered. I know they will say that they got a lot of injury problems last year and so on, but <clears throat> it's hard to recover from a beating like that. Um, as you say, Galway haven't won a league title since 81. Um, both teams have struggled to win national titles, so... I think this is going to be a cracker because I don't see any other way. I know Mayo have a game in six days' time, but I think there's another thing to this that like both these teams can't make a provincial final, obviously. One of them is not going to make a provincial semi-final. So the team that finishes higher in the league or wins the league title will actually be seeded higher than the team that beat in the league final in the All-Ireland. So there's a couple of things up for grabs, but I think just winning a national title for either of these teams at this stage of their development would be huge. It's fascinating because it's it's the best attack against the best defence in Division 1. So Mayo scored 126 points in the league campaign. Uh, to date, Galway have only conceded 81. So the matchups are going to be quite important. Um, Aidan O'Shea has kind of come into his own in this uh, league campaign. 
found his best position no doubt at, at full forward but Sean Kelly at full back for Galway like, we, we, I guess we're expecting those two to be to be on each other but you just you just never know No you don't know and <clears throat> I think if you know and there'll be obviously a lot of planning and plotting this week and you're you're looking at what Sean Kelly's going to do for Galway from an attacking sense on turnovers and so on <clears throat> he's going to do exactly what he did you'd imagine against Kerry where he's just literally going to to bang forward as soon as that ball breaks down he's going to go off Aidan O'Shea so <clears throat> you know Mayo don't want the situation where Aidan is, is tracking 40, 50 and with Sean Kelly it's potentially 70, 80 yards up the field 7 or 8 times a half so you know you're looking at your wing forwards here whoever they play probably Fionn McDonough and Jordan Flynn that they are probably going to be warned that when Sean Kelly goes your job is to track him as quickly as you can and then a corner forward or Aidan O'Shea will drop out to say John Daly at centre back or one of the wing backs to to stop him having to go up the field because he has been so prominent for Mayo in attack he has given them a completely new uh, outlook in terms of how they can play a lot of the times they would run the ball run the ball run the ball and now they're just given that option to play those pops and he's so physically strong and the other thing for Aidan O'Shea if Sean Kelly does pick him up you know if I was him I'd be getting my hand up in the air as quickly as he can and looking for that ball in the air if there's one area that Sean Kelly is and I'm not even going to say it's a weakness because there's there seems to be very little weaknesses in him at the minute. But to try and exploit him physically in terms of size in the air because on the ground he is nearly unmatched in the country at the minute. You wonder if Galway worked on that, that, that long ball into the full-back line because we saw in the All-Ireland final last year, Shawnee, Kerry clearly came to Croke Park with, with that plan to kind of launch the ball on top of the Galway goalkeeper, Conor Gleeson. Uh, and to a large degree it worked David Clifford picked up a lot of marks as well uh, in an attacking sense so th- I mean y- you'd like to think that since from a Galway perspective since the All-Ireland final they'd have worked on that Yeah you'd imagine they would but if you look at the Armagh League game this year they got another very soft goal off it um, as you rightly mentioned Clifford got there was a couple of Hail Mary balls went in mm. that you know were not necessarily a training ground move and Clifford went up and plucked it out of the skies so uh, it's something that's teams are definitely going to target because this Galway team are so well set up defensively. They're so compact when teams try and play in and around them and play through the lines and move it around <coughs> that this is a this is an area of concern for them. It's something that, as you rightly say, they got really exposed at in the All-Ireland final last year. There has been snippets of exposure for them still in the league this year. So, you know, with their management team that's in place there, you can imagine they're putting a huge amount of work in, but it's not an easy fix. It's not, and and uh, yeah, I look at the Galway team in recent games, and you're seeing players coming through like uh, John Mar and Tom O'Callaghan, for example. Robert Finnerty came off the bench as well. They do, ha- they do seem to have a strength and depth that maybe three, four, five years ago they didn't quite have. So they're kind of going from strength to strength. And then you see Damian Comer coming off the bench last week with his bionic leg, like almost adds an extra dimension, an extra ball in as well. Yeah, and he like. He's obviously not as tall as Aidan O'Shea, but he gives them that physical presence in there. He gives them another option of how to play. You know, uh, Tierney has been phenomenal at wing forward. Finnerty was brilliant last year. Like, it really struck to me how good Finnerty is uh, when you saw what Derry did with Finnerty to put Chrissy McCaig on him. Mm. You know, and you're looking at Rory Gallagher has openly come out and said Chrissy goes on who they perceive to be the other opposition's best forward, and they had. Uh, they had um, Shane Walsh and they had Comer. So Finnerty is highly rated by a lot of, you know, very astute inter-county managers. Him coming back is a big thing for them. Like I said, Tierney has been outstanding. They're just, they have a lot of outlets to get scores. So if, if, if Walsh is held down, which is very hard done, someone else will pop up. up. If Comer's held down, which he was in the All-Ireland final, Walsh come up trumps. So they have a lot of strings to their bow, Galway. Would you be a bit worried about... Uh, sorry, worried is definitely overstating it, Johnny, but the Shane Walsh been kept scoreless the last day. I mean, maybe it's just the quality of opposition uh, from play. Uh, he's obviously... He's, maybe he's easing himself back in post-club, post-Australia, and this is just the way it has to go for the next couple of weeks. And once the championship kicks, kicks in, as you say, it gets pretty spicy and kind of pretty quickly. But once it kicks in, that we'll see um, a better version of him, or are you at all worried about that? I'm not. I'm not one bit worried about about Shane Walsh. He is just quality written all over him. Um, like if you looked at the championship last year, like yeah, he got a brilliant goal at one stage in in Connacht against Roscommon, I think. But Armagh, he was fairly well held down. Derry uh, McCluskey did a decent job on him, and then big day All Ireland final just 
you know, complete yeah. explosion of, of talent, class, everything that you look for on all Ireland final day. And he has it in, in spades. So, uh, like, he's a really, really good player. You'd imagine this break will probably do him the world of good. All Ireland uh, club title in his pocket again was held down reasonably well in the All Ireland club final by Glenn. I'd say if the, you know, before that game, if Glenn had said we'll hold Shane Walsh, to, I think he might have got a point from play. Even if he got that, they would have said, "Just we're absolutely delighted with this." But no, no worries about him. I think this break will do him good. He's probably easing himself back in, as you say, and he'll be ready for the for the White Heat Championship. I think. It's tough for us to really assess, I guess, in, in, in the last week or so where, where Mayo were at. In, in, I mean, a raft of changes for that six-point defeat to Monaghan in, in Castlebar. And, of course, Mayo had already secured the Division 1 final. Monaghan were desperate to, to stay up. Um, so so can we can we kind of tell where they're at? Because when, when a team makes a lot of changes like that the week before a final, it, it kind of confuses us all because we don't really know where they're going to go with the team from here. Yeah, well, look, you imagine they're going to go... As strong as they can go on on uh, on Sunday, like Mayo were in a good place, um, but they still need a big performance this weekend, and and, and uh, they need to win this weekend as well, just mm. to just to cement all the positive work that has been done throughout the first six national league games. Now, I, I, if I was if you're doing the Mayo management team, you wouldn't be overly happy with last weekend. Yes, obviously Monon are coming to Castle Bar, fighting for their lives, but a lot of Mayo players got opportunities to put their hand up whether that's to make the 15 or whether that's to make the 26. And they didn't really didn't really perform last week. So Mayo are going to, you'd imagine, go back to the tried and trusted of what they've been trying to do over the first first uh, six National League games. They have been very, very impressive. They've implemented a, um, a defensive structure that I haven't seen them have before with a couple of new uh, bodies in there. And look, they've lost, obviously, two brilliant defenders as well. But... You know, the last time I was on the show, I don't know what way I was feeling, but I tipped them to win the All Ireland, so I can't really <laughs> step away from it now. But this game is a big game for both teams on Sunday. The Division Two final that precedes it uh, on Sunday, Shawnee Cracker, Dublin Derry, um, all looking forward to this one as well. Um, and their game up in Owen Beg, I think it was, or Celtic Park, I can't remember which, but was it was a brilliant, brilliant game. Um, the, the the surprising element last week was was watching a certain Stephen Cluxton running out of the the Dublin dressing room. Uh, 41 years of age, out for a couple of years. We we hadn't heard any rumours of this, which to me in this day and age is quite remarkable with social media especially. Um, has this taken you massively by surprise? And I guess the second part of the question is, does he start because he's Stephen Cluxton? Mm, yeah, massively by surprise. But I think what I will say is, it, for me, that just shows the absolute trust and strength in this Dublin machine and it's been it's not just this year it's been there for since 2013 it's unbelievable that as you say in this day and age that that news did not break now Desi Farrell has openly come out and said that Cluxton has been training for a few weeks <clears throat> like for anybody listening to that it's so hard to believe that and yeah, obviously I do believe it I take the man at, at his word but for nobody to see that witness that and just a little whisper <clears throat> to come out of that camp is incredible. Does he start? No, I don't think he'll start. Um, David O'Hanlon has done re done really, really well in the in the National League. Um, I watched him closely that day in Celtic Park and he was very good. But this is a cracker. I think this is an acid test for Derry. Uh, I, this has actually happened before. I think in 2014, in Division 1, Dublin went up to Celtic Park and lost. And then the National League final, they absolutely disposed of Derry very, very easy. I think I remember Bernard Brogan got a cracker of a goal, hammered them by about you know, 15, 16 points. And again, Derry never recovered. Now, it's important to note, boys, that this is a completely different Derry. And it's also an absolutely completely different Dublin than where they were in 13, 14, 15, 16. So I think it's going to be a cracker. It's the game I'm most looking forward to, I think, this year. It's not very often you go into Division 1 and Division 2 National League finals where you have four All-Ireland um, mm. real All-Ireland contenders playing so it's really good at this early stage of the year Shawnee just one last one on Cluxton for me there was a big debate on the football pod this week uh, Paddy saying that he couldn't possibly see how there would be a negative spin on this James saying it could be a negative uh, in terms of the impact on the team there's been so much debate about that question that you've answered there in relation to whether you should start or not and actually a lot of his former colleagues and I see Dean Rock in one of the papers uh, this morning saying that um, as well that he won't be happy to be in the bench just on that negative, positive thing, where do you sit on it? Absolutely positive. Um, what a player. 
I, I know him particularly well from DCU. Great guy, so focused. Like, um, with Stephen, will he be happy not to play? No. Will he allow that to fester in the group? Absolutely not, from my experience of him. Um, so he's going to add so much. David O'Hanlon has come in this year with very little experience. Imagine the learnings he can get off him. Also, imagine the competition it's going to bring in within those three goalkeepers in O'Hanlon, Comerford and now Cluxton coming back in. To me, competition is still the most important facet of building a really, really competitive team that nobody is safe. You know, you would imagine there, David O'Hanlon, for the first X number of league games, Evan Comerford's injured. He knows he's going to play. Now there's a little bit I need to work harder here. So to me, it can only bring positives to the Dublin camp. Uh, and also the quality he brings. It's not even what he's going to bring off the field. The quality that that man can bring on the field in terms of his kick-out strategies and so on. Now, even if he played this again, you mightn't see the best of him because Derry, Derry likely won't put a massive hard press on him. They'll go man-to-man, which they have done nearly all over the field in terms of kick-outs. And at times, they'll give up kick-outs to him. But long-term, in terms of the championship, he could play a massive part. Just on that that piece that you, you choose, uh, you obviously have played with him and know him inside out. Johnny Sexton used to talk about um, not being too giving to the other uh, tens around the camp. I think that might have changed laterally in his career, but there was certainly a point where he didn't want to be um, showing them exactly all the all the good stuff. What's uh, what would Stephen Cluxon's approach to that be? <laughs> uh, give a little, but you know, there's still a little few tricks of the trade that he might want to give away. I get like the reality is he's fighting now. He has to fight for for his place. He didn't you know when I say he didn't have to do that, he obviously did have to do that, but he was so far ahead and his mentality was so far ahead and he was so driven. And that drive is something that's very very difficult to lose. Does it wane potentially as the years go on and the body gets sore and so on? Yeah, but this man is made of different stuff and um, we've seen, seen that over the last 20 years. You look how far he has come from that famous day against Armagh years ago, I think in, in around, oh, well, I'm going to say 04 or 02 maybe even. Uh, it was a long, long time ago when he when he kicked Stephen McDonald. And like, there's always been a little competitive, sorry, a massive competitive spirit in, in Clucko. He's not coming back for any other reason than to win an All-Ireland and be on the field when Dublin win the All-Ireland. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a fight on, on the hands for those three goalkeepers and I'm saying it's one that he's very, very fully focused on winning. Uh, finally for me, Shawnee, um so mentioned the Division 3 and 4 finals, of course. Uh, Andy Moore not happy with some of the injury time played last weekend from uh, Sligo beat Leitrim. Um, but, but, really good performance from Sligo overall and Leitrim did come back into the game Oshin McConville doing fascinating things with, with that Wicklow team in his first year as well uh, your own County Cavan in the Division 3 decider uh, against Fermanagh in that, that game last week I don't know was it a bit of shadow boxing but Fermanagh got a good win uh, against Cavan on that occasion you might just give us maybe a, a quick prediction then in, in, in four words or slightly more if you want one, two, three and four who's winning each final? Um, well, Cavan uh, <laughs> we'll start, we'll start at Division 3 then go on and <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a massive game for Fermanagh. Fermanagh have, have never won a national title. They've done great work to get promotion, but to, to win a medal in Crow Park would be absolutely huge. Cavan are, are definitely not wanting to go into Armagh slash Antrim. You'd have to say more than likely Armagh in three or four weeks' time on the back of three defeats to Ulster opposition. So both teams are fighting for a huge prize here. I, I think Cavan will win. Um, Division 4 final is I think Sligo will win, but Oshin has done unbelievable work with Wicklow. Sligo have no national title either, so it's amazing you're going into on to Saturday with two teams that have never actually won a national title, mm. never mind won a national title in Crow Park. So there's huge prizes up for stake, and Wicklow won one in 2012, but like they're not there every year. This is going to bring a huge buzz. There'll be a good crowd in Crow Park on 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 uh, on Saturday night, um, and I'm hoping for two big games. But I'm going to go with Sligo and Cavan. And Division One and Two, in two words. <laughs> Um, Derry Just and oh, Galway Right Interesting but I think Mayo will win the All-Ireland <laughs> Yeah oh. They'll bounce back uh, Well I think Mayo won the National League in 2001 and Galway went on to win the All-Ireland so could be could be a reversal of that for sure uh, Shawnee great stuff as always thanks a million Thank you guys thank you have a good day Brilliant catch up again soon Shawnee Johnson there former Calvin footballer Interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, which Kevin turns up is probably a conversation for another day. Yeah. Uh, Fire Pit is up next. John Giles first before that uh, on he was talking to Richie on last night's show. 
I thought we we were under pressure for long periods of the game, but de- but defended well. I mean, the goal against us was a fantastic goal. It was a great shot. You know, you couldn't do anything about it. Uh, but after that, I mean, we're playing a very very good team, as we know, Richie, uh, a team that finished runners up in the, in the World Cup, and like I think in previous matches we would have maybe collapsed a bit, maybe lose two or three, four nil. But that wasn't the case here. We came back into it. We defended when we had to, uh, and then got the goal near the end, uh, which was a, which was a you know the goalkeeper it was unbelievable. The, the the shots, the shots he saved. Sorry, we didn't score. We we, we didn't. Nearly we almost scored near the end, yeah. uh, where the goalkeeper you can pronounce his name, Mike Manion John Manion. Yeah, you know what a save. I mean, we had we two we had two chances. Uh, we had. Um, a great, a great uh, header from Alan Brown, and then an even better header from Nathan Collins. And how we saved a Nathan Collins, I don't know. So, I mean, again, I know it's all ifs and buts, but if we scored at that particular time, then it's a really good result. But I thought the performance was good, and if we keep playing the way we did in a solid manner when we had to defend, we defended when we had a, a chance to attack, we attacked against, again, a very, very, very good team. What is it called, Friday Fire Pit? Friday Fire, 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 Fire Pit. So we just put a bit more thought into dominating the comments about this morning. Miserable and <laughs> <laughs> you got to call it like it is. It's Friday, like what? The Friday Fire Pit. This really needed more breaking news. Breaking news. News just in. John Fallon, uh, reporting football writer John Fallon. Katie McCabe's injury enforced absence against USA in Austin, Texas, April 8th, ends the sequence of 63 consecutive Ireland periods to stretch you back seven years. But the big news swelling and bruising of the foot, no fracture back in a few weeks and the country can exhale and breathe a sigh of relief Kathleen Cameron welcome Ooh. I kind of want to start applauding whenever you said that and just sit mm. in the corner and be yes she's it coming is. back so it was a bit of an Evan Ferguson precaution boot on mm. but everything's grand you should have you should have made noise because uh, Fox were kind of going they were gasping when the indictment of Trump news came through last night you could hear them going <gasps> well if you were a bit camera. closer I would have touched your knee <gasps> oh like oh yes in a theory on Adrienne Henry. Henry. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That would have been fantastic. But uh, anyway, that's amazing. No, it's great news. Um, I saw the lads having a chat last night on PM about whether McCabe, if she was missing for the World Cup, would it be similar to Roy Keane missing in Saipan? I thought it was an interesting discussion that they were having. Uh, bad news for Arsenal is the only thing. Uh, they play City at the weekend. Yeah, they are really right. going to miss her. Whatever. Yeah. If she doesn't, apart from there's three people in the studio, could care less who doesn't play for Arsenal for the rest of the season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. To you. Um, well, yeah. Well, it's a bit like the Johnny Sexton thing ahead yeah. of the World Cup. You know, yeah. should is it differently about that one? Better know. to not have her playing for the rest of the season and coming in fresh and ready to go for the World Cup, or is it better to have that game time under your belt? I feel like with football, it's slightly different. And I feel like you kind of need that sort of match sharpness in a different way than with rugby. When is the Champions League final? Ooh, May. May. It's like mid-May, so, I think. Good, or good, something. good chance you'll be back. I mean, well, if, if they get there. Yeah. Um, I think the semi-finals so look, that is, is good. Like we can all we can all rest easy again. Can yeah. I just say general one in the fire pit? Mm-hmm. So general comment. I've got a. Uh, Got a lot of messages this week. Okay, it's, you, you might be surprised to hear that. Uh, a <laughs> lot, lot of messages. Um, yeah, some some negative, some positive. But uh, it's been it's been a week where I've got a few messages about the fire pit as well, and they're the only ones I'm only choosing to focus this week, guys, on the on the positive. Yeah, uh, because at the end of the day, as I said, we're floating on a positive ball. Positive messages. Well, yeah, of course, we're, we're we're floating on a ball of rock through space here right now, so there's no point focusing on negative stuff. But certainly, from a fire pit perspective. Got a few people saying. Good week for the fire pit. Keep the fire pit going. Yeah, yeah. Keep it going. It's uh, it, it needs a bit of work. Maybe some people have said, but it's it's getting there. All right. Yeah. Week on week, I think. What, what's their critique? What's yeah, their that feels critique? like a bit of a. I yeah. don't know. Maybe. Do you want to go back and find out what they would? I'll, 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 I'll double check with them. But I think they're they're happy with the progression that, the, that they've shown so with far. The needs a bit of work. Comments coming from Bullum Kuhig or other yeah, burner accounts. Possibly. Okay. We but sometimes a bit of work can be byword for. Scrap that and do something else. No, no. If people said keep it going, keep it okay, lit. Okay. Yeah. So keep trying. Right. Oh well. Let's crack on. Uh, on that note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's. Uh, All yours. I was thinking about this this week. Um, going through the mind of Cameron Hill can be a dangerous prospect at times. But um, we're only into it. And you've already spoken about yourself in the third person. There's, we we need to call this out. Oh, why? See it in every, What's wrong with this? That's something that we should call out generally. Yeah. People talking about themselves in the third person. Uh, you know. Uh, oh, it's going into my mind. That. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. It's we more lyrical. We it's it's a very know. Cameron thing to do. It's very you Cameron do Hill think about, do, or you do talk about yourself in the third person quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think you know. it's okay as as good colleagues for us to say. 
Stop that now. No, no, just to say that's that's happening and you can decide after that what, mm. you, what you would like to do with that information. Worst in, like intervention ever. Mm. Look, we've noticed you're, you're indulging and you do what you want with that information. Exactly. Um, but I was thinking about like the match day experience because we've, you know, between various different games that have come and are to come between the Ireland-France on Monday night and there's a big All-Ireland... Um, Champions Cup clash coming tomorrow Leinster Ulster there's the league final this weekend next week Bose Rovers I was thinking about what is your ideal match day like the process that goes into that so you know how do you form the day when does the day begin for you are you going for pints before the game after the game do you get them during um, that kind of thing so Adrian Question. maybe you can take us through well I think I'll let Kathleen kick us off here I'm oh, oh. I'm uh, Passing the baton along. Absolutely. <laughs> All the way over to Well, I think it kind of depends on what sort of, like, what match you're going to. So, like, mm. if it's something, if it's a all Ireland final or, I don't know, Champions League final or something that your team is in and you're really anxious and nervous for it, I think that's very different to, like, I don't know, going along with a couple of your mates to a game that maybe doesn't matter all that much or a team you don't support. Um, I can't say I actually have any sort of regular schedule. Like it kind of depends match to match what I do. Depends um, on the timing of the match. You know? yeah. yeah, like if it's early in the day, you're probably not going for a couple of pints beforehand. Um, What's your ideal kickoff time well, or throw in time if you're going to get as much into the day as possible? I think uh, afternoon. I think a three or a four o'clock kickoff. I like a half five. A half five is a yeah. I'd love like a really random like a, like a four thirty seven p.m. kickoff or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, just give me just or a, switch it up. Why do we stick to these? A URC seven twenty five kind of really weird bus time table isn't it? Yeah. kick off TV times mm. five minutes of build up <laughs> yeah. mm. straight in, and it's all in Irish anyway, so you can't understand it. I think it does depend. Like if I'm going to a, a Monaghan match in Clonus or at home, I'm generally not having a pint. I'm just going to the match and watching the match. That's another thing as well. If you have to travel, yeah. If you're, but yes. if you're going to a big Monaghan match in Croke Park, you know, I'm going. I'm having a few pints. So it depends entirely on I the context. I think your camera is saying that. Uh, let's take the Crow Park experience. Yeah, that's, idea. yeah. That, well, that, 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 that's definitely a pint. That's definitely a couple of pints beforehand. If you go to a match in England, it's a weekend. There, there it's are a social other things event. to do. I, 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 we've, you know, what's your ideal? Ask four Irish people what's their ideal match day experience, and all you will get is chat about pints. pints. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, half yeah. and half scarves as well. Um, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to ask. Are you, if you're getting a memento from the day? Are you taking a scarf or a match day program, or what's your? Are you taking the? You know, have some places have branded cups for the pints. Mm. Is that your memento for the day? What would be the ideal one? It's the memories, obviously. Oh yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, take yeah. photographs. Well, I mean, famously, anyway. we can't take yeah, photographs. Yeah, no photographs matches, so, no, not during the match. We photograph match. police over here, of course, yeah. before and <laughs> after yeah. the match. Tell you exactly how you should behave in a match. I have, I have probably hundreds. It's heading for the thousands of programs at home. Uh, like from dad kept programs from the seventies, eighties, nineties, like right through. I've What's the plan for them? I don't know. Pass them on to my kids, who will no doubt, as soon as I shuffle off this mortal coil, uh, put them into a big pile and burn them, um, mm. or sell them on eBay for for two euro each. Um, I I'm don't know. Say I, I, something controversial. Were you? I'm over programs. Oh no, Ooh. Cameron, you uh, can't I'm, say that. I, I, there was a time and a place where I was like, I have to get a program, and now. Do you mean? Do you mean? Like, but you would still buy a program when you get there, or no? No. Oh, wow. Wouldn't anymore. That's controversial. If there my was program, a point, yeah. If they get water damaged, or as in the case with the Latvia game last week, mine got beer damaged, it actually rips apart my soul a little bit. I'm like, mm. it actually You're hurts me. you around to try and find another one. You're trying to, but you, it, sometimes mm. they're not there. Mm. It's, yeah. it's, it's not, not easy. The half and half scarf thing, we brought it up this morning before the show. Like, I, I did, I was at a Manchester United match before at Old Trafford. I think it was a Sevilla game in the Champions League years ago uh, when United got knocked out. In the Bishop Blaze pub, Near, right beside Old Trafford before the match I'm wearing this this scarf is uh, half Republic of Ireland and half it's Irish Reds basically there's a the United element to the scarf as well uh, and I was told in no uncertain terms by a woman who came up to me to get out wow. take it off or get out and uh, security came over and I explained to them this is an Irish you know this this isn't Liverpool, Liverpool or Sevilla <laughs> this, is not, this is not a uh, there's no other club on the other side of this scarf so I think that's that that uh, woke me up to the perils of half and half scarves and how people have some very strong opinions on them I'm a sucker for a half and half my thoughts on programmes no half, half and half, half scarves oh half and half scarves uh, I really don't 
have that much of an opinion on them. Like, I think people get very precious about it, and mm. I don't really understand it, especially... Like, Shane, to be fair, you did say earlier that if you're going to, I don't know, United Liverpool and you have a half-and-half and, half and you're a United fan, it's a bit weird. But I also think, it's like, the whole thing of a half-and-half, half, it's kind of like a jersey that has the date on it. You know, it, yeah. it's like a memento of the match, and it's not so much saying, I support the team, it's I was at... Old Trafford and I watched United Liverpool on this date and you know I I don't know I just I feel people get hepped up about them for no particular reason but then the half and half scarves have the crest of both clubs whereas those jerseys will have will just be the jersey of the team and a little reference to the to the date and the match yeah but it's you're not, like not a half, ne- half jersey but like it's, you're not necessarily saying by having one that you like support you know, you're not saying like you support United less because half the scarf is Liverpool. Like it could just be a memento of the match, and mm. like mm. this is a game I went to see, and these are the two teams that were playing. Or like I don't know, even if it's outside of that, if you're I don't know, I might go over to Spain and see El Clasico, and oh, yeah. I have like a that's okay Madrid Barcelona but half and half. If you were scarf. Spanish, if, if you're you were, Spanish, it wouldn't be okay if at you were all. The Spanish version of Shane, there, you'd be like, Whoa, I don't know. Boy, I think yeah. it's Where's one of those. Where's the modern of Spain? Again, that I think is just kind of like fan policing in my head. A little like, bit. Let like, people um, do what they want. My brother and I have amassed quite a collection of scarves now because he's taken over my mantle at the Viva Stewarding gig. So oh, yeah. we've collected, like, this last couple of months, we've got an Ireland Latvia, an Ireland France. We're, we're really looking forward to getting an Ireland Gibraltar scarf. That's going to be like the pinnacle of the collection. But, um, Oh, I think scarves are, are great. I think Shane feels collection. very strongly about this, but in the company that he's in, who've all said, who really cares, he's reluctant well, to... Well, no, hold on. Uh, like, if the Republic of Ireland are playing Latvia, like last week, someone came up to me and said, do you want to uh, buy a half and half scarf? And I was like, no. Um, but if the Republic of Ireland are playing Brazil, that's a novelty fixture. And the little bit of yellow looks kind of cool. What? I'm going to buy that scarf. Cause I that's, would argue so that you're an there's so many asterisks. is a much more of a novelty <laughs> yeah, yeah. than... No, no, sorry, no, novelty. He's Play, an a la carte apologist. For playing Brazil is like a... That's a that's an event, that's a thing, that's a social... That's like everyone knows Brazil are a good football mm. team. But Latvia is like a... Ass. But you can't say you'd buy one for that and then judge someone who would buy an Ireland-Latvia one either. Oh, I will. I can and will. <laughs> I no, just I, think it's... it's I can't entirely... Stone Age it's stuff. Just who cares? If Sorry, go on, move go it on by, then if you want. They're, they're, they, look, let's face it; they are generally for kids, right? And kids will <laughs> and kids at heart, and they will absolutely love them. And if an adult wants to buy one, don't start telling them to get out of a pub because they're wearing a half and half scarf. Cop yourself on; you're an adult. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't specifically aimed at you, but maybe including you. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're part <laughs> of the aimed problem. Aimed at the woman from your story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> you get another topic. Um, I was kind of. While I was supposed to be doing work out there earlier, um, when someone mentioned the coffee World Eleven, and kind of sparked me into life. Um, Brayburn. Well, we all, we, we all dream of a. Team they, it, of it's Brayburn. a jersey it's with the Gary Brayburns. Yeah. Gary Brayburn <laughs> could say <laughs> <laughs> almost. Yeah. It would have the Brayburn sponsor on. I think the Brayburn sponsor look nice on a jersey. Good. Um, but I was thinking of like what coffees would play each position. So I think you'd have like a centre back pairing of Americanos. For instance, because they're hard and hard, like no, no BS yeah. with an Americano. An espresso is like your flashy centre forward. Yeah. Macchiato on the wing. Macchiato on the wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Latte. Latte. Goalkeeper. No. See, I think latte. Yeah, as a goalkeeper, because they're a little bit stodgy, aren't they? Yeah. As well, like what a flat frappuccino. Frappuccino. Ooh, frappuccino's on the bench. Frappuccino is the player who got the big transfer and then didn't work out. Baby Chino in the academy. Baby Chinos and the Baby Chinos is our... Uh, of all the things I thought I would 20s. spend my morning doing, <laughs> I know. this is fully not... I also, because of where I'm sitting, I feel like I'm just like off to the side and I'm like, am, bang, I, Catherine, am I dreaming? On. Did I actually get out of yeah. bed this where would morning? You, where <laughs> would you uh, I think central attack. When I said, do we have another topic? This isn't exactly what came into my head, but this is, it's a fascinating tangent. Yeah, no, I just thought, like, I'd love to see an espresso we haven't banging said a few goals. Yet. I'm not happy that we've... we've would cappuccino. Before. Would cappuccino be a goalkeeper? Yeah, could be. A bit too messy. bit too much messing around. Yeah, yeah, but like, I don't know. Extremely hot. Like the hot-headed goalkeeper. I'm thinking like Pickford would make a great cappuccino. Extra hot cappuccino. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. Extra dry. Where have we gone here? Where have we <laughs> no gone? Idea. You see, you don't need <laughs> just fire nice. to warm up. Coffee can do it as well. But um, what else did we have on <laughs> the topics I'm looking today? at you, Cameron. This is all yours. Are you? Did you pick your squad number? Earlier, from earlier's chat, uh, I didn't really. I wouldn't be that attached. I can see 
all the numbers are lovely. <laughs> so, they, they're, exactly. sure, they all have lovely numbers. They all, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Adrian is very much taking the sit back and just like <laughs> let everything happen and approach this morning. Beautiful things about this. Let people beautiful. do what they want to do. I don't care about much. numbers. The overused, uh, the cliches in sport was one thing we might, we briefly mentioned before the show as well that, mm. you know, phrases that are commonly used. I think you had a couple of examples. Oh yeah, my, my, I hate the phrase, you can't be missing those. Or he, he almost did it too well. He's got to hit the target. And, and, uh, you can't be missing those shots. Surely you can't miss any shot, because what's the point otherwise? If you were to remove the cliches and from sport and those phrases that were used all the time or the stuff that doesn't make any sense, there'd be not much left. No, 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 no. But I think the, there are some that really, really frustrate me. Mm. Like, uh, you can't be missing those. I think legend is used way too much. Yeah. About D- every Dummy team. Dummy team, bogey team. The town end. I'm just looking at GEA cliches here. There, there, are, there are a lot of those. Mm. Like, <laughs> Well, the town, you were talking Kathleen the other week, you were like, oh, come on, the town. And I was like, why is Kathleen talking about it alone? But, uh, <laughs> sure, look at it. Sure Every look town in Ireland, I think, has a, they're the town. Dundalk, yeah, say yeah, they're yeah, the, town. the town. Dundalk town, yeah, at Lone Town. Monaghan town, would you say, come Ma- on the town? Come on the town, we'd say come on the town, yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's like United. Newcastle. I support United. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a very flexible, like you're you're getting a lot of terms in there. Mm. Well, they're cliches that um, I don't like. That was another episode of The Fire Pit. <laughs> 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 oh, what's it called, Friday Fire Pit? Friday Fire Pit, Friday. Friday. So we just put a bit more thought into dominating this comments about this morning. Miserable you got to call it like it is. It's Friday, like, come on. The Friday Fire Pit. <laughs> All right, that is, uh, yeah. There we are. Uh, quarter past nine, and you're watching Got to Be AM. We are here every weekday morning, as you're aware, at this stage. And uh, all but thanks to Gillette Labs, get the ultimate shaver, your money back. Neon Night uh, Edition is available now. Here are some highlights coming up at the Got to Be Podcast Network today. John Giles, the Women's Six Nations show uh, with Alison Miller, and um, in, chat, uh, in chats with Nathan, uh, Nathan Richie during the week. And uh, League of Ireland Match Day is up there as well. Uh, you can follow OTB across social and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network after the break. Uh, we're doing a thing with Jess Kelly and we will figure out exactly what that is after the break. Before that, uh, Richie, Will and Anne-Marie talking about the impact of a potential Katie McCabe. Uh, she'll be fine, by the way. We know now she's got to be fine. But if we roll back the clock a few minutes, it potentially been absent from Ireland. We've had a text in from Sarah and from Condra. This is going to get tongues wagging. Would losing Katie McCabe for this World Cup be a bigger blow than losing Roy Keane, Keane in 2002? Going. From Sarah and from Condra. That's a hell of a question. It's probably on par in terms of blow. Yeah, I think it would be. You consider the conversation every time Richie around the Republic of Ireland playing his style of football and everything else is, yeah. could we clone Katie McCabe and have her to be able to play left wing back but also be able to play further forward? It's always the discussion around if Ireland could be more ambitious, Katie needs to be further up the pitch and uh, sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't and Vera Powell will always go for her system which is going to have and she wants Katie McCabe to be involved so she thinks the best way to go is that left wing back I think it would be a huge blow to me there's two crucially important players for Ireland that need to be on the pitch if they have any aspirations of getting out of the group that's Denise O'Sullivan and Katie McCabe I think if they lost either of the two it takes so much of a creative fulcrum away from the team at a time when Ireland don't have a top striker who's going to be able to feed off scraps anyway I think if you take either of them away it would be massive definitely on a par with losing I think the, the defence probably doesn't get enough of a, a look in there as well the likes of Louise Quinn at the back mm. are, are huge and have such experience built up now at this stage and such familiarity with what Vera Pell wants to do that they are lost too I think that's, yeah. that's if you, comparable if you take it they're probably Nephi and Louise Quinn are the definite starters within the three Right. and then maybe say Aoife Mannion who's been very impressive since declaring for Ireland will probably, might be the third like Louise Quinn and Fahey have got like 100 caps and that's really? just huge like the leadership of Katie, though, you can't underestimate. And As even a, what she's going to gain... Roy wasn't a good leader. And even what she's going <laughs> to gain go. in the next couple of months, like possibly going to a Champions League final and being involved in a WSL title race. So she's obviously the leader in that dressing room. Even that's turned out a lot, though. Like, there was genuinely a feeling where I think Arsenal fans didn't want she her to go to Chelsea. Fate, yeah. But there was that feeling that maybe she has become expendable at Arsenal. Maybe this transfer might actually happen, particularly when Chelsea are offering a British transfer record fee, allegedly, yeah. at the tail end of the window. There was that feeling that maybe Katie might go to the team that she supports and go play for Chelsea. And now she's become crucially important for Arsenal again. You could see the reaction even from the Arsenal fans last night was a big concern for them with the Champions League particularly. You're listening to OTB AM. AM. The Football Pod. 
even if that's not the case. He, just the fact that they believe that he's the yeah, best coach 100%, is, yeah, is yeah. unbelievably powerful. Then if the fact that he is as well is an ex, is the cherry on top. But once you get that boy in, no matter what he says in training, we are doing that to the best of our ability. And whatever he says, we're taking it onto the field. Like that's the buy-in that sometimes coaches, if there's any bit of doubt, they don't get that. Subscribe to the Football Pod wherever you get your podcasts. The Heineken Champions Cup is back. Leinster take on Ulster in the round of 16, Saturday, April 1st at 5.30 in the Aviva Stadium. Join the Sea of Blue for this massive inter-provincial clash. Tickets on sale now at leinsterrugby.ie. Terms and conditions apply. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Which is in relation to... Hello there. <laughs> dark, dark screen. Welcome yeah. along. Ooh. Ominous here. Yeah. Jess Kelly, good morning to you. Hi, how's things? Um, things have been okay up to this point, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, the machine is configuring itself here and I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm so happy um, that it's doing that because I came in two hours early to make sure that all this stuff happened before we came on air. Yeah, no, no, that was good. You did really well because otherwise the slot would not happen now and hopefully it updates itself in the final 4% very shortly. Um, our audience, when you were in here a month ago, were, you know, they've been in touch every single day since then mm -hmm. saying, when are you going to make this slot happen? So this yeah. is the fruition of the last month of work. Yes, it's, it's been a long time coming, but for, for those who didn't know, we have the PSVR 2, so that's the PlayStation Virtual Reality headset, the second iteration of it that came out a while ago. Uh, we have a PlayStation 5 and we have a lovely uh, Microsoft Surface Hub here. And I've been calling this Operation Make Adrian Puke. Yeah, <laughs> he looks nervous already. It's not about a gaming slot, it's not <laughs> about experiencing VR. So first things first, while that's happening, I need to give you this. Okay. This, this feels like we've suddenly gone into like, uh, <laughs> who wants to be a millionaire or something? No, you, this isn't a prize. This is in case you puke. So you well, don't we don't oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I thought, oh wow. I oh, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, no, I, no. if I kayak for far enough, was that genuinely yeah. a puke bag? That's it's all I could find. Wow. Uh, so if you want to puke, that's good improvisation there. I like it's that. Be, it's very, very good TV. I'm a, I'm a solution. You, uh, you get a lot of these things. Are you are you a bubble person? A bubble person. You get a lot of these things in the bubble wrap. Oh, bubble wraps, yeah. I like, you know, the big fat ones when there's like an iPhone oh. in a box and oh, it's very you can exciting. Sort of scrunch them up. This um, is going to be a shit show like the toy show. This is, except it's adults, not children, we're dealing with here. Have you a password to put into this that we need to not have you on screen for? The first curse. No, the no, no, we're call. all good. Don't worry. Okay, okay this good. is This is part of my preparation. Very good. But this I is appreciate. all been looked after. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Keep that close at hand. Thank you, Jess. So please bear with us. And if you want to send any words of encouragement or uh, piss taking, please do because. There's going to be a bit involved here. So, so just a reminder to the audience as well that we did it. We ran a league recently, Virgin Media um, Games Room, yeah. and I finished top of that league. So I. Well, am you're holding those wrong. So that doesn't really <laughs> echo I, with that right? sentiment. For, that's right. There, for there. people listening, not watching, so we Idrin's got a couple of um, handheld he handsets, and he's about to put on a headset, and we're going to try a bit of virtual reality kayaking. Is that what we're doing, Jess? This is what we're doing. So it's a game called Kayak uh, Mirage VR. This is my favorite game out of all of the ones that I've tested for the PSVR 2. So if I could get you to take out your in-ear and pop this on. This is where it gets interesting. Yeah, no, so I'm going to just make the... We're going headset. into flightless mode now. Yeah. Mm. I mean, <laughs> was this under stewardship oh, wow. before? I'm oh, glad. I can actually see the room. How cool is that? So should I put these things yeah, in? Yeah, put them in and then I'm just going to come closer to you for a second. Make sure you're holding yeah. the controller. This is new that you can actually see what's just going on in the room. Just hang on one second. I'm going to try and explain. Down. I'm going to try and commentate on this as best I can, but Adrian has... Comfortable? Jess is currently Perfect, putting yeah. the VR okay. headset on Adrian's yes. head. So now he is in a different world. He's in a different universe. Okay, He's so not able to probably hear. Are you able to hear us, Adrian? No, I can hear you. All right. Hear us all right, Sorry. no problem. Uh, Wait, no, hang on. Wait, let's just. Even though it's real, it's like I'm looking at things now through a camera. Yeah, so we can see on the big screen what Adrian can see in his so in his uh, in his little universe. There. Yeah. That hand through there. Nice so is Adrian in the metaverse now? Or what universe is he in? No. So this is this is the PlayStation world. This is essentially augmented reality because what you can see on the screen and what Adrian can see is he can see kind of his own surroundings as well as the. Um, they're just saying about motion. Safety warnings are rest. coming up on screen here, which is going to fill Adrian full of confidence. Check your play area settings. Yeah. This is My laptop is getting. Should he be standing up or sit or is sitting down all right here? Or? He can do either or. Um, are we safe, Jess? So will you look all around you? Oh. Wow. And look up and down. And for those, again, who aren't uh, watching, you're listening, 
it's a, it's kind of like in Batman when Bruce Wayne looks around and he's got the Batman suit on and you've that got that sonar cool. vision. It's a series of blue triangles that morph into boxes. Look up to the ceiling as well. That are like 3D, that capture every single element of what's around. Because so it should needs, I do 360 or? Yeah, if you can do 360, okay, 360 just yeah. because it needs to make sure that you are in a safe space. Okay, Room scanning good to go. complete. And we are good now to go. Now I'm seeing a, seri seeing a series of... Have you ever kayaked in real life, Adrian? That's I have. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I've done a kayaking course, actually, Shane. Awesome. Yeah. Experience, okay. Yeah, Should we be pouring ago. water on Adrian to make it feel real? <laughs> is my question. Oh! Okay, hey. so here we are. We have landed. Okay, so can you wow. press X so on your controller? I'm in a kayak. So let me just so see. What we see on screen is, uh, see. it seems okay, to be a large okay, swimming pool. We've got a, Adrian's in a okay. kayak. There's a beach ball. There's okay. also a little floating um, flamingo. I want to say there's a, there's a it's like the swimming pool at Trinity College. It's a, except for about ten times bigger. It's a pretty nice room actually that Adrian is currently What's in. What's X, Jess? Is that this one? No, no, no. So it's the th this one here. So hang on, watch. There's a bit of uh, light uh, shopping center okay, music in the Bend background here as well. There we go. There we go. Which so is, uh, fascinating. We've got a clock on the wall, I think, to inform Adrian. So nothing's happening at that. When he has to go it? home. If you look all around you. That is very cool. Uh, oh, the kayak. Hello. Yeah, you're in a kayak. Yeah. There's the so, uh, changing area. Very he's good. currently looking around his, his, uh, his room. No diving. Fair enough. So the X, I still have. Can you mentioned. look down at your hands? Well, okay, no, can I can't see them. I can, sorry, oh, I no, can't. No, your virtual hands. Okay, hang on with that. I'm going to take out my phone and film this as well because this is too good not to film. Hang on there now. Hang and on there's a nice there little now. sort of um, lift music there in the background. Yeah. So, hang on now. Are you good in the water, Adrian? Um, I'd be okay. I have done uh, triathlons. As Swim for a mile. We did. We did okay, so what we're going to do now is, Adrian, if you can look on the screen where it says the Antarctica. So we've got Papagayo in Costa Rica, Bjornia in Norway. Oh, sorry, in the middle there, I can, yeah. Sierra Cove in Antarctica. That's where we're going. Yeah, we're going to go to the Antarctica. Oh, this is going to be very scenic. Okay, and we're going to go. do a free roam and we'll do it at sunset. Oh, why not? Oh, yeah. icebergs and all. Now, so again, I have to stand. My so now I'm just seeing two red. Oh, now we have. Oh, hey. Oh, we're in a lovely part of Antarctica here. Sierra Cove oh, looks like the, a gorgeous uh, place. Paddle. Now, yeah. so what you do is move your handies as if you oh, are. Cool. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, this is oh, too How good. cool is this? The evening sun glistening off the ice That bridge. is absolutely beautiful. So look all around you, look up, look down. I will be here for the day. You can um, sort of go, out your, go about your business as... What I want you to do, though, is can you crash into one of the icebergs? Cause I want well, you I was to trying feel to avoid them, Jess, but thanks for... Uh, look, yeah. this is a demonstration. Oh, oh, good man, Adrian. Get a bit of right oh, hand Oh, there's a little bit there. of... You, feel a little you can of... feel the haptic. So the brilliant thing about this uh, controller, the two controllers, is that when you bash into something, you get that sensation. Or if you like, if something zooms past your head or something like that, you can feel the sensations. And because you've got the in-ear headphones, you really are immersed into a different. Do you world. know what you can feel? Oh, there's penguins. Um, <laughs> do you know what you can feel, right? <laughs> now said this that. is slightly bizarre, but oh, there is penguins. obviously an immersive experience. Yeah. You can sort of feel. You almost feel as if your body feels as if you're knocking into these things. It's weird, isn't it? It, it completely is transforms you. And. You know, there are some games that are um, better than others when it comes to the smooth sensation. There's Gran Turismo 7, which I've been playing a little bit, which is a racing game. Oh, very cool. But it makes me feel very, very ill. Yeah. And I think it's because things zoom by in your peripheral vision. Of course. This oh, is... Oh, I've hit the iceberg with the paddle. Yeah. Very good. I was but what you can do as well is, say if you got like stranded a little bit, you can use the paddle to push you away from the side. So yeah. say, oh, for example, if you're in the pool and this stuff. This is like kayaking out of Milford Sound. This is fantastic. I'm guessing you can climb Patrick up on one of the icebergs, Jess. Well, we can give it a go. Yeah. What um, am I looking to do, Shane? Can you get up on one of them icebergs? There's a bird. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. Or maybe no, you're just going to... I don't know how that falls into the uh, whole situation here. <laughs> I'd say that's I'm going easy. out through this thing here. Can you see that? Yeah, um, yeah, loop? yeah. We can, we see, can yeah, see everything yeah. that you can see. I presume this is the thing that everybody does. They're like, oh, an opening. In through the loop, yeah. Ah! Yeah. So the, the thing about this oh, game cool. is you can do this to relax and to unwind. This is one of the more experiential type games. Oh, I can, I'm having that. I thought oh, you were going to miss the goal there. You're a Westmead man, so you might have missed it. Oh, Orca oh, whale. Wow. Hello. Is that a killer whale? How cool is was he, that? Is he in an danger? Orca, yeah, is that a safety orca. message? Is that why there was a cool safety message? This is, and penguins too, Adrian. I know oh, you like them. there's a deserted boat over there. I like the Ooh. penguins. How many people? Do you think 10 out of 10 people who come out there and see the deserted boat? Get over to that whale, Adrian. I actually have to Can you actually, can you, will the whale come back? This is mad. This is so cool. This is the most fun I've had. It's actually quite all week. Uh, tiring in the arms, Jess. It is, yeah. And that's the thing that people don't fully understand is that although it's a virtual experience, there's an element of physicality to it. You are engaging. As we spoke about the last time I was here, you know, you guys were asking if there are any more sport games and that there are more coming down the track, but you just need to be aware of your surroundings. Now, as you can see, as Adrian is looking around this room, the OTB studio, 
you can see on the screen it's here what better. he's actually seeing in the virtual mm -hmm. world. And he can look all around, he can change direction, he can move. So you have this option of the free roam, as it's called, or you can get into races. Is there, um, the okay. races are I do terrifying. a race if there's one going. Will we do a race? Yeah, yeah, I'd take on a race. Might as well. Yeah. That okay. sky, by the way, looks very real. It do, it's it? incredible. To be honest, uh, like, it all looks, the, the water is a slight bit, sort of semi over there. Well, if you lean well, over your say. chair and look down, so lean over and look oh, down wow. in the water. Oh, jeez, oh. So there are other experiences. So we chose this one just because it's the one that I've used the most. But there are other experiences where real. the look water is <laughs> so incredibly clear. How do your, do, are your arms, hands tired now? Just up here, Shane, up around this right, area. Yeah, the bicep area. Biceps, that's yeah, what yeah. you call them, yeah. That's where the bicep should be, is it? That's it, where they should be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, very cool. I must say, it, I can definitely see the attraction of can you, can you choose actual locations to kayak around? No, at the moment there are set locations, so you get to choose these ones, and then as I okay. said, there's the racing option. But the cool thing is with the racing, so say if we had one here for Shane as well, mm. you and Shane could have a kayak race, and you'd be able to see him in front oh, of you. Oh, we know what way that'll go. Beat each other. I mean, come on. Well, I'm, I'm liking that. So I do a bit of Zwifting at home, and one of the Zwift. big attractions of it is that What's you can... What's Zwifting? Zwifting is the um, casting experience. So you, you cast... So I choose a route, let's say I go to New York, and there's like 50 other real people who are also going to have a cycle around New York. Okay. And so I go around the actual, I go around, like I can cycle around the High Line, I can cycle around Central Park, so it's all real. Right, now right, it, right. It's because it's not VR, it doesn't look as real as this, of course. Yeah. But this, that would be quite cool if I could say, okay, I'd like to kayak down the Shannon Inn at Lone, for example. I've, yeah. I've seen people do the VR standing on, on the ledge of a high building and getting nauseous, but I've also seen Ronnie O'Sullivan play VR favorite snooker, My where he literally lean, goes to lean on the table to take I've a shot the clip and completely that, yeah. falls over. Brilliant. Can I just ask, so does the nauseousness, because I'm not feeling in the slightest bit nauseous right now, does that kick in? when you take the headset off? Can you take it off now? Because I, I was playing with it in our boss's office a little while ago and my tummy feels a little bit queasy yeah, now. Okay. Um, I, I also think it's... there's a. Um, oh, you've gotten faster, Adrian. Yeah, I can definitely... showing yeah. off now. Oh, wow. So I've given you the easy mode here, but if we'd gone to nighttime or a stormy scene, you would get the sensation of, you know, the turbulence Bob or the, the right. bobbing around the place, which is a bit disconcerting. Oh, we should have given him the This is going to make a great podcast. Terrain. I just, yeah. Yeah. I just want someone to gif it. Can we gif Adrian looking like this? Because as cool as the game is, you don't. I really can only look imagine that cool. what an idiot I look like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you do look pretty. You do look pretty idiotic at the but best like, times. But what's this the is alternative. You know what I mean? Well, this is it. Uh, do you want to try and do a race? I take on a race. Yeah, and we'll oh. wrap it up then. We put people out of their misery. Okay. <laughs> it's very. Cool. No, it's brilliant. It's brilliant, Adrian. So just give us that for a second. Let's keep this going. It's yeah, for anyone listening, now, I would urge you to get the YouTube video of this. Okay, uh, so off the ball on YouTube, give us a subscribe. As good as the podcast, Smash that be, like it's button. not really the full immersive experience yet. No. No. Uh, okay. Um, can I just, uh, uh, the expression open the kimono seems to have been used an awful lot this week. It has. But I'll just open the kimono a little bit if you don't mind. We were about to do this lot, and uh, our brilliant, brilliant producer, Colm, came in and said, Listen, I said I had to take out my earpiece so I wouldn't be able to hear him because I've got to put these earpieces You're in. Hang them. And he said, That's no problem. Yeah. I'll just type into you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you just Useful. put this in your hand again and hit, hit on start? Jess um, is just choosing a place called Coralicious. Which is which sounds so you see, fantastic. So you're going to press the, the on the back, but just you have to look at the screen and look at where it says start. And click on because start. Because the thing with this is that it uses your eye tracking calibration. So oh, you see wow. down. Does he oh, just blink? Sorry, Does he blink then to press enter, or what happens? In some cases, you can do that, and then in other cases, you're using the physical controllers. Yeah. But it's all about oh, your right. eyes. So part of the setup that I was doing before we came on air, because oh, it had no never way. been oh, three, two, in the news talk oh, office shit. before, yeah. uh, <laughs> is ensuring that uh, oh, cool. the eye tracking was ah. enabled and stuff like that. Go on, Adrian, you buy you. You're going. Ah, Let's ah, go through the team. Through the, through the, ah, ah, I pole. got the wrong way. Get over here. Two second penalty for hitting the pole there. <laughs> is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. Damn it. So don't hit the poles if you can. You're heading through uh, chicane number two here. And we're going to hit a pole. Oh, you avoided the poles. Well done, Which Adrian. Where am I going? 22 seconds gone here. We've got to look for number three. Where's the next one? Ah! Where's gate number I three? I've got to crash you're into the beach. You're heading for the beach, lad. Whoa! Oh, that's, that's Ouch! <laughs> He's hit the table. Oh, Things come are going on. I've run aground. Things are going <laughs> pretty south next? pretty quickly here. Where is it? Folks, I don't know what's going <laughs> on here. Do you any guidance here? Adrian's lost the plot. He looks like oh, he's Jesus, a boxer now. He's literally smacking the table. I'm like trying to. There we go. 44 seconds gone. Where to, is the next? Trying to turn just around go here. Go straight ahead. Go. Over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This uh, desk is really not helping me. No, I just say go not. straight ahead. That's good advice. Uh, the backpedaling I must say, is not a. Well, I just think it's your technique, though, Paul. No, yeah. the, is that me over? Oh, that's me over there. Oh, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 
Okay. Right, let's get Gate number three. We're back on track. Now. We don't know how many. How wow, many look gates at that there down are. there. Look at the, oh, the coral reef. water I was talking about. That's very middle, clear. Very cool. a terrible athlete here in the middle of a race talking about the, the reef. About the coral reef, I know. Which is uh, not advisable if you're a sports person to be admiring the scenery around you. Uh, looking very for cool. gate number three. Oh, look, 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 look. You missed. There's 54 meters, 47 meters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go, yeah. go, go. You're, you're closing down. You've got 40, 40 meters. That's thing down there. I think everyone else has finished the race at this point. Yeah. Oh, Andrew, you're going to fall out of the, the kayak there, but uh, let's not do oh, that. I see the arrows now. That's yeah. a bit, oh, there's a fish. Yeah, there's a fish. Looks like right. a rainbow fish. Hello. There, there's a penguin. Um, <laughs> number three coming up here. you got to make sure you don't hit the pole. We don't want a two-second penalty here, Adrian. Good man. Well done. Don't, don't hit the rocks. Ah! Get on rocks. Ah! Off a cliff that here. did feel as if I hit them like. Yeah, that's Push amazing. away, use your oar to push away. Off this thing? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Isn't it cool? Yeah, I didn't wow. know I could do that. So, now I'm going out to sea, apparently. For anyone listening, I would, I would urge you just to, to not listen and just watch this. This is uh, quite amazing, Adrian. In a, this is in like a going around Bull Island or Ireland's um, Eye. Ireland's it's, Eye. It's quite incredible. This is uh, coming around the bend oh, here. here. We go. We've here got we go. uh, a left hand turn here for Adrian. Owen Rhinish, you Adrian haven't Barry. got a patch on me, buddy. He's, he's staying well away from the cliffs. He's about 16 metres away from yeah, the Yeah, uh, take anything out of the weather. Fourth gate. Be amazing. This Thank is going guess. to be carnage here. Can he avoid the poles here and avoid a two second penalty? Yeah, he has done so, oh. but has he avoided the cliffs? No. 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 He's going to have to push off again. We've got two I'm minutes and 19 seconds on the clock. I don't know when this ends, but I'm going to keep commentating like it's exciting. Knock We're going to take a right hand turn. Adrian, good man. This is so cool. How do you feel right now? I feel as if, am I hitting something there? Yeah, my cable. Are, do we need a left hand turn? Take this chicane. Oh, look at that for a move. Oh, yeah, it's not a chicane, but it's a gate. But you're lucky. Oh, oh. oh, wow, we avoided I just penalty. Hit, I just punched myself straight in the face. Somehow the penalty has been avoided here. Uh, it feels as if either my muscles are. Finish line is inside, it, Adrian. I'm 40 not meters away. Enough ground, like, oh, is this the finish line? Okay, finish line. let's go. Can you get there in under let's three go. minutes? Can you do it in under, th under three minutes? I don't know. I don't know how far away that is. It was that first it's left turn that Oh, you're nearly there. You're almost there. Under three minutes will be a great score here. 255.73, uh, nice well done. Six six gates, it turns out. No medal, it says, at the top. Bullshit. Which is <laughs> That's not realistic. Okay, well, there you go. say, that is very, very cool. That's, Look at the coral reef. Well, can we just take reef, a yeah. moment to acknowledge people who don't understand the attractiveness of eSports. Oh, yeah. And the competitive edge and the commentary yeah. and how it's a thing. Big time. We just saw it there. This is, so I'm excited by that. Well, I have to say, right, like... I've never done this before, but um, Hit the gate it's so much fun. And I could easily see how, uh, like doing a race, for example. Yeah. That would be a brilliant way. To, and like, you're, like you were saying, you're probably trying to put yourself in a position where you don't have all this paraphernalia around you yeah. and you've got a bit of room to do it. And it could actually be a brilliant workout. Oh, yeah, no, 100%. And as more games come on, we're going to see more and more of that. But I just think for the moment, people just need to get acclimatized to it. Like, I'm interested to see how you're going to feel now when you take this oh, yeah. off. It's like in a far oh, yeah. more advanced so somebody VR to take Nintendo Wii. I'm really not sure where I am. Uh, okay. This is going to be interesting now. See how sick Adrian feels. Maybe it'll be okay. There's your envelope. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what that feels like? What? You know when you go into the pub? I do. And then in the middle of the day, and then you leave. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's suddenly darkness outside. Yeah. After a number of hours. Yeah. That's what it feels it's like. disorientating, Very right? disorientating. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, it's, it's hard to believe I'm in a studio now, honestly. Yeah. No, it's, uh, and that's, it's the disorient it's the overall disorientation, I think. And like, as you can see, the, the headset's down on the desk now, but you can see, still see the, the detail. Yeah. So everything that you were experiencing there, we were able to see and okay. we were able to laugh at. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do think it's an, it's an incredible piece of technology. It is 600 quid and you do that's need so the PS5. Yeah. Um, but I think on a fun factor level, it is great. There are also Star Wars games that are brilliant. Uh, oh, space, but a space be class. Well, I you think that should, space the, that should be the next one that we'll do for you. Yeah. Maybe in there a few weeks' time we'll bring that in and you can have a go. Make my dreams reality of going to space. No yeah. problem. We can That'd make be that happen. That was brilliant, Jess. Thanks, man. I really enjoyed that. It actually yeah. worked. I'm yeah, so re I've never been so nervous doing something. But Could it have gone. <laughs> yeah. it's great. We didn't even need this. I mean, I don't want to be talking about the past tense because yeah. who yeah. really knows. Uh, but I have to say that was great. Like, um, it's what, what were we doing that for? Like five or six minutes? Maybe a bit oh, more. Oh, it was longer it? than that. Longer, yeah. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. Ago, like, yeah. was it that long? Yeah. Uh, the headset I can definitely see after a little while. Like, it's kind of sweaty and it gets a bit itchy. And I and find it like hurts like the bridge of my nose, and then okay. it also you are because I wear glasses. I find that it does take me a little while just to get used to the yeah. headset and then taking it off again. That type that's of thing. That's fascinating that you only thought it was five or six minutes. I know time is a construct like of a human perception. This is like interstellar, where time maybe slowed down for you within that that well, universe. Well, like it took you three minutes to do the race. It did okay, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so then we had a few minutes in the pool, and then the, yeah. like, so, the, 
the time does go by very mm. quickly. What's great about this is as well, you can put the Netflix app on, you can access Netflix and stuff like that and have like a private home okay. virtual uh, cinema experience. So you can watch your content okay. in what's a virtual cinema. Amazing. So there's loads of uses for it. Yeah. I really like it. I just think I'm excited to see what other titles come down the track and then how different people mm. feel once they're in the VR world. I'd love know? someday if I'm abroad for a Monaghan match, big Monaghan match that I miss and I can just stick on a headset and, and sit, pick my seat That's in Croke Park. That's watch something else rather than the coming. match. <laughs> no, I'd watch the match, of course. I'd been <laughs> looking around me. Amazing. Um, Jess Kelly, thanks a million for coming in. Thank you. People want more of this stuff, which of course they do. Yes, we are actually talking about gaming on this week's Tech Talk, so you can find the podcast now, wherever you get your podcasts, or tune in to News Talk tomorrow at 5. Brilliant. And you'll come into us again down the track and we'll do this all over again with Shane and we can laugh at you. <laughs> you just promise me that's the only thing I ask. We're going to laugh at every member of Team OTB over the next well, year. That's people, my goal. People coming in now. I'm we sure should do a puke few. Olympics. Oh, See yeah. who's the first <laughs> yeah, one to yeah. get sick. Well, yeah. I have to read something off the uh, laptop now. So, okay, go. You know, Here's your, where's your envelope? Long away. <laughs> uh, thanks a million, Jess. Thank on you. Monday's show, the uh, amazing Gillette Labs performance rankings. We'll have Daniel Harris looking back at the weekend's football. Alison Miller will uh, look back on Ireland's win over France. Right, uh, Morris Brosnan on the football. Uh, we'll have Keen Tracy on the rugby as well, and plenty more besides as well. We'll have uh, Rafa Hannanstein right now, though, uh, from the Athletic on the show last night. Have a wonderful weekend. Welcome back to tonight's football show. Richie McCormack here with you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Now, round about this time last week, we started to get reports filtering through from different sources in Germany that Bayern were about to pull the plug on Julian Nagelsmann's time in charge of Bayern Munich. Uh, that did since come to pass and Thomas Tuchel was promptly installed as his replacement at the Allianz Arena and wouldn't you know it Tuchel's first game in charge will come this weekend against his former side Borussia Dortmund to pick through the events that have occurred over the last seven days and perhaps those that preceded it as well I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line by the, the Athletics Raphael Honigstein Raphael welcome back to the show Thanks for having me. Uh, like I say, to some this was a surprise, but dig a little deeper and this seems to have been brewing for a little while, that being Nagelsmann's departure from Bayern. Yes, it's both surprising and not entirely surprising because Nagelsmann's stay in Munich hasn't always been happy from the from the get-go, really. They've had a poor spell second half of last season when they got knocked out by Villarreal in the Champions League, 5-0 by Borussia Mönchengladbach in the German Cup just about started on to win the German championship. But of course, that is just the minimum requirement in Munich. And when this second half of the season again started with some stuttering performances and Bayern only winning five out of their 10 games in the Bundesliga, uh, there was a sense of Bayern trying to anticipate almost failure and react before it's happened. Uh, they didn't want to risk the season imploding they have huge games coming up in the next month. As you said, Borussia Dortmund on Saturday. Then they have Freiburg. Then they have Freiburg in the Cup. And then they have the Champions League against Manchester City. So everything could be over as far as Bayern are concerned uh, very soon. And that's why they felt with Tuchel being available, it would, consider, it would be considered a serious upgrade and more chance of success. It's harsh, but that's how Bayern operate. Uh, they will not even contemplate the possibility of failure, let it on failure itself. Yeah, and, and there are many who will point out that perhaps finishing second is, is not necessarily failure, but those are the yardsticks by which Bayern have always measured themselves. And I, like the whole FC Hollywood tag usually comes to bear when the, the board there are at their most vocal, and it seems that they got most vocal and most antsy in the last few weeks. Was the, was the Leverkusen results the final straw? Was that string of draws that they had in January the kind of thing that set them on edge? Uh, what was it? Because I've heard everything from uh, player relationships to unwanted ski trips and all this kind of stuff as, as regards mitigating factors towards is, is sacking their Nagelsmanns. I mean, there was a lot going on with Nagelsmann on and off the pitch, but he was already on very shaky ground before the two games against PSG. As it happens, Bayern, of course, won and played pretty convincingly in both of them, certainly the second one. And that prolonged... This, uh, this lack of confidence and these, these doubts that were sort of always there. Whenever Bayern had a good game, people thought, OK, that's it. Uh, things are on course. And then it would have a bad game, a bad result. And the Leverkusen performance was so abject and so poor and so disorganized. And half the team didn't seem to know what system they're playing. It certainly one or two players it took a long time to understand that Nagelsmann had changed the system 10 minutes into the, into the first half. That Bayern no longer had 
the confidence. Um, you can call it FC Hollywood in terms of their readiness and a lack of scruples and ruthlessness to pull the plug. But in a way, it was a very considered and very calculated decision, which had nothing to do with um, with drama or politics or personal problems. Mm. In, in fact, the relationship with Nagelsmann was pretty good all, all the way until the end. This was a business decision. This was a performance-related decision. And even looking beyond the good results where they often saw, okay, we won today, but actually considering the quality that we have, it was another shaky game we could have drawn we could have lost we should have a lot more dominance and consistency with this team and they believe that Tuchel can deliver that I think without Tuchel being available now yeah Nagelsmann probably lives to fight another day but because Tuchel is there and could do the job immediately Bayern felt more confident and making that radical move was the fact that I, I, I because we we're talking about them on the show tonight as well was the Spurs situation a factor in all of this because if you look at when Bayern decided to act it's when another big Premier League job suddenly became available and one that might be attractive to Thomas Tuchel so did that Conte situation at Spurs factor into the thinking of the Bayern board when they were decided to act and because they essentially had him in a holding pattern am I right in saying and that he'd been living in Bavaria he's been in and around the area for the last few months and the perceived wisdom was that he was going to be installed in the summer anyway uh, did the Spurs situation have a knock-on effect here? I think it might have been Bayern's uh, preference to install him in the summer, but the situation escalated both in terms of results and, as you said, Tuchel uh, being heavily linked and certainly having options. And they wanted to avoid the scenario that happened five years ago when they really liked Tuchel, talked to him to follow Jupp Heynckes at the time. Um, but they had some internal disagreements. Uh, some people on the board really wanted Tuchel. Others were not so sure. By the time they had all got together and said, yes, Tuchel is our man, Tuchel had signed for PSG. And uh, I think they, they saw that as a credible threat. And whether that was then actively pushed by people in the negotiation or not is almost irrelevant. Bayern felt that if Nagelsmann is not the long-term answer, and if we continue to have these doubts, and if nothing will change for the better next season, we're in a better position now to get Tuchel, the guy that we have been wanting for a while, and that guy is probably, as far as German-speaking managers go, the number two on the market um, behind Jurgen Klopp, who's not available, then you have to do this now. And that's why I think things kind of escalated very quickly on Thursday night. Do we know when those kind of discussions started happening with Thomas Tuchel to have him, like I say, in that holding pattern in the background? Well, he and the and the team and the club uh, have said on the record that negotiations started only on, on on Tuesday last week after the Leverkusen game. Uh, that might be true as far as the direct conversation between him and the club is concerned, but I'm sure that there would have been some exploratory uh, talks being held to see if Tuchel might be available. And uh, it is my understanding that Bayern weren't necessarily eager to do this at the moment, but because of the Leverkusen a result and then the chance that Tuchel might not wait that much longer, um, things took on a life of its own. So um, I think the the chance of, of, of missing out on Tuchel and then staggering on with Nagelsmann, even though they weren't quite sure, that was a scenario they wanted to avoid, even if it comes at the short-term price of being seen as as ruthless, as capricious, as FC Hollywood, as doing things that no other team would do. They're prepared to rather have the criticism now than have the season take a turn for the worse, Tuchel moving somewhere else, and then people saying, well, you saw that things weren't going in the right direction with Nagelsmann. Why didn't you react? Now you can't even get Tuchel. If you want to find Nagelsmann, then you, you're going to scramble around for third and fourth choice, as you did with Niko Kovac in 2018. So I think they wanted to avoid that. And uh, that kind of experience of 2018 definitely played a big role in their readiness to move now. I don't think anybody at that level of management has a small ego, but it, I think it tells something of the ego of, of Thomas Tuchel that he is more than willing to take on this situation where he has to overhaul Borussia Dortmund in the Bundesliga. He's taking over a team that were fantastic in the Champions League uh, this season. They'd won all their games. They won, it was eight games. I think they only conceded a goal or two goals, sorry, in one of those games. So their Champions League record is remarkable heading into this Manchester City tie. 
when I don't think anybody would, you know, say that losing would be a a, a, um, a some massive surprise because this is a, a 50-50, 60-40 contest, whichever way you want to split it. Um, but it says something of the man that he's willing to put that all on the line in his first few games in charge. I don't think it's a case of ego in this uh, specific case. I think this is just him looking at a team that uh, could be doing a lot better than they have done with a fantastic squad at, at the port disposal. And if they find just more consistency, then they have a realistic chance of winning everything. Mm. Yes, of course, when you're a Bayern, then a failure is is always an option. But failure means not winning uh, with a team that is designed to win and has all the possibilities of winning, not just domestically, but also in the Champions League. So as far as a ready-made squad is con- for, for Tuchel's kind of game plan and his ideas is concerned, I think it doesn't really get much closer to Bayern, especially being in Germany. Mm. And uh, having a lot of young players still that want to work, I think with a coach that is very uh, tactically uh, sophisticated. So I think it was a bit of a no-brainer for Tuchel. Um, Of course, Real Madrid would have held some appeal for him as well, I'm sure. But um, having worked at PSG, I think as far as working with big egos is concerned, even though Bayern have plenty of big egos, I think they're still at a different level. Yeah. Ones. I, I mean, and, and to that point, you look at the uh, personalities that are involved uh, on a boardroom level and both with Tuchel then as well. And you look at the track record that he's had at Chelsea and at Paris Saint-Germain most recently, uh, his last two clubs. It looks like this is a powder keg environment for everybody to try and coexist in within the next two years or however long this relationship ends up lasting. Yeah, I think it's going to be naive to think that there's not going to be friction at some point. Um, Tuchel has had uh, issues at Dortmund, especially, uh, and at PSG, where people on the board try to actively interfere with his coaching and his decision-making process. Uh, Chelsea was different until the new owners. Um, Marina and Roman Abramovich were very hands-off. No one even went to Cobham to see his training let alone make any suggestions of what he should do differently. So with the new ownership, that things became very difficult. Uh, And I would say in Tuchel's defense that it probably wasn't really down to him. Um, With Bayern, they will let him get on with it. Um, And as was the case with Nagelsmann, as long as he's winning, they are uh, very supportive. The moment they feel that um, he's not really getting the maximum out of the squad, then they get nervous and, and see... If um, if they can talk to him or make some suggestions, but uh, at the moment we're still very much in the honeymoon period with not even a single ball having been kicked, and uh, I think those uh, possible uh, boiling points um, can wait for another day. But yes, they will come, mm. um, and Bayern are uh, steeled for it, having worked with the likes of Pep Guardiola, who was very difficult as well. Um, but the results overweigh everything. Do we know what the immediate reaction uh, to Tuchel has been like on on the training ground with Bayern players? He hasn't seen many of them yet because of the international break. I think he's worked with five of them on Tuesday. A few more would have come back yesterday and today. So I think it'll be a while before there's a proper training session uh, Friday, but this is the game before the day, the day before the game. So that's not even a, a full session either. So it'll be it'll take some time. Um, some players really like Nagelsmann. Uh, some players like Goretzka and Kimmich went on the record saying that uh, they will miss him. But at the same time, they are professionals. And if they feel that Tuchel gives them um, good information, makes it easier for them to play, makes it more realistic that they will win, more probable, then they will like him. Um, and if he doesn't, then they will not like him. Or if he doesn't play one or two players, then they'll be disappointed, as is the case in every dressing room everywhere in the world. So um, Tuchel will have to, I think, find the kind of stability and maybe even simplicity that was evading Nagelsmann a little bit. Nagelsmann was very hands-on and sometimes seemed to be doing things almost to show off a little bit. And the team, I think in recent weeks didn't seem to be quite on the same page as he was and that's I think part of the explanation why we saw very uneven games even when Bayern did win they had periods where it it didn't seem a very organized side Um, Tuchel's job I think is to simplify things 
and to give them a system that they feel stable and confident in. Yeah, and I think we saw most definitely when things were in a similar situation when he arrived in Chelsea, he instilled a formation, he instilled a style of play that was you know, easy enough for the players to get to grips with and then build upon from there. And that was something that stood out from the Nagelsmann at least the end of the, the, the his reign there, that formations would chop and change, the starting 11 would chop and change. He was very much a take each game as it comes in the respect that he wanted to approach each opposition differently and it wasn't necessarily pressing home a Bayern style onto them. And that's, I think that might be a lot of things for a lot for, for Bayern fans, Bayern players to get used to as well, is that they shouldn't have to cater and kowtow to the opposition that they're Bayern Munich and they have the better players and they're the better squad that they should be able to go out and, and put their steady starting 11 together and put together a string of results that just weren't coming really Yeah and they made that point to him before the start of the season and he uh, seemed to appreciate it and, and said he wanted to change and wanted to uh, become more independent of the opposition but I guess when you see the game at, at this kind of level where you see it as a chess game, you feel almost moved to react and to anticipate what your opponent might do. And that Guardiola did the same. And there were people saying that were saying that if Guardiola hadn't been so interventionist, maybe Bayern would have won a Champions League uh, in his reign, which of course was the trophy that eluded him. At the same time, they had a consistency in the league that... Um, kind of outweighed all the problems and Bayern would have re- loved to keep Guardiola longer because they played at an incredible level even if they failed at a semi-final stage of the Champions League three times. Nagelsmann isn't quite Guardiola yet. Nagelsmann isn't quite the guy that has the buy-in at this point from, from the Bayern players, which is why his Guardiola-inspired tactics and, and coaching perhaps didn't quite fall on fruitful um, soil as much as as it did for Guardiola. Tuchel is also a Guardiola, a Guardiolista, if you want, Uh, hugely inspired by him. But I think he's got the experience from his time as PSG where the the, the egos outweighed the system and uh, and now at Chelsea to, I think, adapt his ideas and find common ground and find a happy medium. He will still have to rotate because otherwise he won't be able to keep the squad happy. But I think you have to do it in a way that people understand why he's doing it and perhaps spend a lot of time explaining things, talking to players. Again, things that Nagelsmann perhaps neglected a little bit. What is next for, for Julian Nagelsmann? Because it, it can get lost in all of this that the guy's still only 35, that most you know uh, managers haven't even considered managing by, by his age yet. Or at least that's where the point where the kind of tipping point is and they might consider a future in football. And he's now been through a couple of big jobs already. Like, is, is the next stop for him naturally in England or elsewhere? Or has there been any kind of thought from his end as to where he might lead next? Well, when you're at Bayern, it's, it's hard to... Um, have Everyone else next... is down. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. In Germany, certainly. Yeah. I mean, we saw that Niko Kovac had to reinvent himself um, at uh, Valfel Wolfsburg with a degree of success, but of course he's not seen in the same bracket anymore. I think Nagelsmann is a different type of manager. I think he is seriously talented and even with those negative experiences, I think you'd struggle to find anyone in Germany who'd say he's not the third most exciting um, German-speaking manager in in the league or you know on the market at the moment so he will have offers i think he'll be very careful to choose the right spot i think before too long he will end up in the premier league whether that's already his next natural step i'm not 100 percent sure because the kind of things that he struggled with at bayern to be the speaking um the talking head to be the face of the of the, the club to have this constant exposure I think it's even worse in the Premier League where there's no CEO there's no sports director at least taking some of the media duties away from you and these are the things that he found hardest so I think he'd be very careful to to make that move Um, but the big office will be coming because people see him as a as a genuine talent and as somebody who can really help teams perform really well um, I think a sabbatical might not be the worst idea for him yeah. to go and see different things, learn a thing, learn a few things, reflect. But at the same time, as we saw with Klopp, 
when a, an off of the right magnitude come comes along, then your sabbatical gets cut short quite quickly. So I don't think he'll be out of the job for too long. Uh, and uh, football here on Off the Ball is brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport, and Premier Sports. It's probably too glib a question, um, uh, Rafa. But does the Bundesliga need Borussia Dortmund to win the title this year? I think it would help the Bundesliga. Mm. It would help maybe even Bayern in a strange way that uh, this challenge is not just an empty threat and it keeps them on their toes and it forces them to innovate and to be better. But um, it's going to be difficult now. I think Bayern have shown weakness this year and last year. Dortmund were not in a position to take advantage last year. This time they might have been. But will that weakness of Bayern persist? I doubt that with Tuchel in charge. And again, I come back to the um, Kovac situation when he was in charge, by far the weakest manager that, that Bayern have had for, for a couple of decades. He was bad, but Dortmund were nowhere and couldn't take advantage then. And that was, I think, the best chance. And then we wouldn't be having this horrible situation for the Bundesliga where it's 10 years in a row. You'd have five and four or what, something like that, which is still <laughs> quite dominant but would change the dynamic a little bit. So yes, I think it would be great for the league if Dortmund can pull this off. But because of what Bayern have done recently, I think the chances have diminished. I think even using a term like pull it off probably explains the situation uh, more concisely than any of us could, uh, could because it seems like it, it's an achievement against the odds to, to go and win a league in the, in the situation that they're in and uh, in the place that they're coming from. And as judged by you know previous regimes, be it under Klopp or be it under Tuchel, the inability inability to sustain these little peaks that they've had, I mean, that's always going to be the problem, I guess. It is because they need to have the perfect season and they need weakness from Bayern in order to succeed because they don't start from an equal position. They start from a position where Bayern turn over, give or take, 700 million euros and they're around about the 450, 500 euro mark. Mm. So that gap always means Bayern have a deeper squad, have better players, and unless they have a massive (laughs) screw-up, which uh, might have happened this season, Dortmund don't really have a chance to to push them. Uh, Where they have uh, fallen short of their own expectations is because they should be the Bayern Munich of the rest of the Bundesliga sides. They should be dominating all the other 17 teams, or 16 if you include them. And that's where they have been a little bit inefficient and ineffective. Um, This year, in the second half of the season, they seem to have got their act together. Whether that's going to be enough to push a Bayern team that will, I think, have learned from, from their issues and will be in a better position to see this out, I'm doubtful. But it'd be great if it were to happen. Yeah, it's uh, going to be an interesting last couple of months for sure uh, in the Bundesliga and to see how Bayern track as well in Europe, uh, especially going into that tie with Manchester City in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Raphael Honigstein, an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Raphael. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. OTB GM.